Good evening. This is Chairwoman Tierra Booker DeWire. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, September 10, 2024. May I have a motion to go into closed session as permitted by Open Meetings Act, as found in the Annotated Code of Maryland, General Provisions Article 3-305, B1 and B7, to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. So, so moved. Moved. Second, Chike Kalu. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Ham? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? No. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Chikakalu? Yes. Ms. Tulusky? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. So at this time, I, we appreciate everyone attending, so please don't leave the building. We are going to come back to open session. <coughs> um, but at this time, we're going to have to ask you to exit the, um, this room so that we can continue with closed session to discuss personnel matters. And then right after we're done, we're going to have everyone come back in for the open session. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for your patience. And, um, and we are going to continue on with our meeting. And so I now invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Chika Kalu. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being broadcast through the BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity's channel 73, and Verizon Finals, Files channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is consideration of the September 10th agenda. Dr. Rogers, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? or changes to this evening's agenda. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals and to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The closed session summary and the open session information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters and for that I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pomfrey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, members of the board. I'd like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves, deceased recognition of service, and certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D5? So moved, Stolowski. Do I have a second? Second, Lichter. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Hem? Yes. Ms. Frempong? No. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Chikakalu? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Let's see, one should go. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? 
Yes, okay. motion carries. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments and for that I call on Dr. Rogers. Good evening, Madam Chair Booker, Vice Chair Pumphrey and members of the board. I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. Assistant Principal, Franklin Middle School and Supervisor, Prevention and Intervention Programs, Baltimore County Detention Center, Office of Extended Learning Opportunities. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in Exhibit E1? So move, Lictor. Do I have a second? Second, Harvey. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Hemp? Yes. Ms. Rumpel? Yes. Ms. Lictor? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Chikakalu? Yes. Ms. Delusky? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Okay. Motion carries. Dr. Rogers? Thank you. Our first appointment this evening is Dennis Floyd. Dennis, please stand. Dennis is attending. <laughs> Dennis is attending this evening with his wife, April Floyd, being appointed as the supervisor, prevention and intervention program, Baltimore County Detention Center in the Office of Extended Learning Opportunities. With 21 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, Dennis' experiences include special education science teacher at Woodlawn Middle School, special education inclusion teacher, classroom teacher, resource teacher, and behavior intervention teacher at Sussex Elementary School, specialist in the Office of Education Options, and resource teacher and career technology education career navigator at Sparrows Point High School. Prior to that, he served as career to work teacher at the Children's Guild. Congratulations. Final appointment this evening is Rebecca Gorman. Please stand. <laughs> Rebecca is attending this evening with her son, Bailey Peacock, and her mother, Sharon Wexler. They can stand as well. <laughs> Rebecca is being appointed as the assistant principal at Franklin Middle School. She also has her principal, Brian Schiffer, here. Uh, with nine years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her previous experience include English teacher at Milford Mill Academy. Prior to that, she served as an English teacher at New Life Christian School. Congratulations. Congratulations to all the new appointees. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. If not selected to address the board, members of the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. The Baltimore County Police Department's Homeland Security Unit and Office of School Safety has recommended safety and security protocols which are posted in the boardroom and available in board docs and on the board's participation by the public website. While we encourage public input on policies, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. Inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior such as language that promotes violence against a BCPS employee or that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order and will not be tolerated. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. Please observe the three minute clock which will let you know when your time is up. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time or prior to, to that time at the discretion of the board chair. And so our first category of speakers are our school system affiliated groups. And we are happy to have our, bottom, our representative from Baltimore County Student Council, um, J Jordan Salkid. And please um, correct me if I mispronounce your last name and please introduce your, the other student board member with you. Council. <laughs> student <laughs> council member, sorry, we have one student board member. <laughs> we will get that straight. She got that straight with me very quick. <laughs> Good evening, Chair, Ms. Brooker Dwyer, Vice Chair, Ms. Pumphrey, Dr. Rogers, student member, Ms. T.K. Kalu, and other members of the board. I am Jordan Salkeld, the BCSE President. And I am Forsett Agumbe, the BCSE Vice President. Today we are back to update you on the status of the Baltimore County Student Council, or BCSE. 
On Tuesday, August 20th, BCSC, in collaboration with the Baltimore County Junior Councils, hosted our executive board retreat at the Randallstown Community Center, where we educated our members on the functions of BCSC, along with their specific responsibilities as board members. Additionally, all executive board members were required to lay out specific goals they would like to accomplish during their term. These goal goals included three action steps per goal, check-in dates, as well as deadlines. Each executive board member is ex expected to fulfill all goals and go beyond their position descriptions. For example, our student workshop coordinators are working towards getting the majority of our executive board members student workshop presenters certified, while our, while our evaluations coordinators are brainstorming effective ways to receive adequate feedback. This year, BCSC will also be hosting eight virtual seminars open to all BCPS students. These seminars include the topics of advocacy, student resources, school safety, mental health, diversity, equity, and inclusion, SMOB outreach, environmental, and finally, to close off the year, leadership opportunities around the county. These seminars will allow students the opportunity to share their experiences and feelings regarding these topics. Our seminar coordinators, along with the various positions on our executive board, will work, th will work throughout the year to ensure each seminar is providing students with information on the topic and acting as an open space for students to share their positive experiences their concerns, or even just their opinions on each topic. We hope to see a large number of students attending each seminar. In order for these seminars to be effective in the betterment of BCPS and the overall well-being of students, we are eager to collaborate with BCPS offices to ensure students' voices are heard. We hope that as these seminars continue, we have at least one BCPS staff member at each one, ensuring that student voices are being heard and taken into account. Finally, our applications for both the BCSE committees and the Board of Selected Students are officially open. These, these are an amazing opportunity for students to get involved beyond their school by planning activities and even providing our amazing SMOB with information. BOSS applications close on September 18th, while committee's cl application closes on the 20th. Thank you for allowing us to speak here again, and we thank you for all you do for BCS students. We hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Our next speaker group is our nonprofit community groups. And um, we have up first the Continental Societies Incorporated Baltimore County Chapter. Um, we have President Lawings, Lawings here to um, share about the Baltimore County Chapter. Good evening, Board Chair Booker DeWire, Dr. Rogers, Vice Chair Pumphrey, Board members and guests. My name is Lynn Lawings. I'm the president of Baltimore County Chapter Continental Societies. Just to tell you, the Continental Societies started in 1956 by in a group of energetic, energetic and dedicated service-oriented women to foster and promote and develop the welfare of underserved children and youth. Now we are 50 chapters strong in 21 states over the United States, including the District of Columbia and Bermuda, and we continue to grow. During our 23-24 program year under health, education, employment, recreation, arts, and humanities programs, we provided service for children and youth of the Baltimore County Schools. These initiative programs have had a significant impact on the educational and personal development of children, aligning with the mission to change lives. Recognizing the importance in physical and emotional well-being for academic success, we supported activities in various schools. We did a winter coat drive, health and community wellness fair, jump rope for health activities, African American reading, stop the bleed campaign, as well as provided PPEs during every event that we have had with children and youth, and also the red ribbon event, Death Say No to Drugs. Thanks to the tireless dedication of our members, it takes a village. We know that investing in our children is investing in the future. We are excited to continue partnering with Baltimore County's public schools. Thank you on the behalf of the members of the Baltimore County Continental Society. And I just want to say that we, throughout the whole United States, we are the largest chapter and we've got an award. We have 50 members and they work very well and very hard. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to continued partnership. Our next speaker is um, Ms. Vicki Vestridge from the Baltimore County Equity and Justice Table. Good evening, 
Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, School Sub Superintendent Dr. Rogers, and all other members of the school board and community members in the audience. My name is Vicki Vestrich. I am a co-leader with the grassroots organization Indivisible Towson, and we are one of 20 plus partner groups in a coalition of organizations supporting the mission of the Baltimore County Education Justice Table, known as BCEJT. Um, I also have a seat on the BCPS Community School Steering Committee as a, com as a community member. During the 22-23 and 23-24 school years, BCEJT organized and conducted eight listening sessions in communities around Baltimore County. In addition, last year we met with individual board members to share our wish list for the transformative community schools model for the now 91 eligible Baltimore County schools this year. We are planning in cooperation with community school facilitators on hosting 10 more sessions this coming school year. We call this Whole Communities, Whole Students campaign. The whole of this work has been conducted by volunteers who care about all students and the communities in which they live. And I will read, we had shared our wish list um, last year with the school board, but I'm going to list the, um, read out the items six through 10 that were on that wish list. Number six, and this is in concordant with the recommendations from the uh, Maryland Blueprint. Uh, so no, item six, the school board commits to hold BCPS accountable to ensuring that the BCPS website is accurately updated with the status of each community school and with the names of the community school facilitators. <laughs> item seven, the school board commits to hold BCPS accountable to ensuring that each community school's website is updated regularly with at least the basics about what a community school is in Baltimore County, the name of the community school facilitator, access to community school resources, including the needs assessment in various languages and a calendar of events. Eight, transparency regarding BCPS's work with contractors who are helping the system um, implement community schools. And number nine, regular meetings with the Office of Community Schools for updates on community schools implement implementation and to collaborate on community education. Number 10, community organizing training and initial and ongoing professional development for community school facilitators and related hires during their onboarding process and throughout their employment. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Thank you. Next, we have our individual citizens or students, and our first speaker is Ms. Sharon Seroff. Good evening, everyone. I'm not sure you're going to like what I have to say, but I think it needs to be said, especially in lieu of what happened last week in Georgia and our neighboring county of Hartford. I am here to talk to you about safety and security in your buildings, and particularly for students with disabilities. I know I mentioned the last time I was here that I was dealing with school emergencies the first week of school. One of them involved safety. I'm gonna get to that in a moment. I have experienced in the last couple of weeks the following experiences that should never be happening in a school system. Going to a school building and finding a door unlocked with a sign on it that says open. How secure is that building? Coming to an IEP meeting and expecting to be buzzed into that elementary school and instead being told to go around the back to a particular portable. This is a school that has not seen me in their building for 10 years. Having personnel in the building that understands what plan of action needs to be taken for anyone who enters that nurse's office. A 
client of mine had a situation the first week of school. This is a client who was mute, selectively. And instead of looking at her file to figure out what to do to help her, the nurse in the building called the police because the student was acting strange. We could have avoided a disaster, because that's what's going on right now, if we had simply looked at the child's file. If you don't look at the file, you're not gonna know whether or not a child has an allergy that can be life-threatening. If you don't look at the file, you're not going to know whether or not that child is going to elope during a fire drill. Can you imagine looking for a seven-year-old during a fire drill when you have 22 other kids? This needs. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferrone. evening to all. I'm so glad to see on the news that the school system is installing cameras at the exterior of the buses. And I just like to use my memory, my aged memory, that five years ago, Mr. McMillian um, requested that in the board meeting. It did not really pass at the time. So thank you, Mr. McMillian. Um, the question in my mind, why it took five years when the idea was there five years ago to implement it today. So since we are talking about cameras, I'd like to talk to you about the curriculum. Ibn Haytham is a mathematician, an Arab mathematician, that is the father of optics, the father of the cameras that we are installing in our security system and, and buses. And not really to go in details, but whenever I had chance to see the curriculum, I see very little of mentioning Arab contributions, Muslim contributions. I see some negatives, some stereotype Islamophobia. So I really like the school system to consider that and I asked for it by email many times. What I like to address with you is policy 3710. That's the security policy. And the security policy talks about the superintendent identifying and evaluating any pattern of safety concerns on the school property or at school sponsored activity like this place. So. I want to reflect on my experience in July when I was ejected for standing up and taking a short video. Um, you know, the people who stood up today, that's a violation of that ugly sign that is there on the left side. I don't know what standing up really is a security issue. Um, you know, standing up means using your psoas muscle, thigh muscle, but actually, the tongue sometimes is more dangerous than, than these. And, you know, I am a physician, I know, I'm not really a policeman, but it's really an ugly policy. I ask you, Madam Superintendent, to remove that policy, standing up for stretching, for passing gas, I'm sorry, I do GI, for doing anything, you know, around, eating something, is not a security risk and that sign must go down. I really appreciate it that you take it down. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Amber Holt.
evening. My name is Amber Holt, as you just heard. I'm a parent of a senior. Um, on January 10th, 2023, as all of you know, uh, Keeley Johnson was able to enter Lansdowne High School with a military-style knife. Wait, so, uh, so Ms. Holt, you cannot reference the name of a student or um, any staff or personnel? Okay, well, said person entered the school with a military <laughs> knife, military-style knife, this big, okay? Not a switchblade. She trapped my daughter inside of a school, inside of the bathroom at school, and stabbed her and 37 so times. Ms. Holt, uh, I'm, so anything I'm that's to a point. so nothing that promote that promotes violence or or any uh, of that. So you can get to your point without specifically mentioning a student, um, injuring a student. Um, any of that is not allowed during public comment. So I'm not allowed to, to talk about how my daughter almost lost her life in your hands? So you can speak about it, but you cannot reference, you cannot say the name of a specific student, you cannot um, talk about the reenactment of it. Okay, can you, can you restart my time then, please? I would at least appreciate that so I can get back to where I was. I worked very hard on this today. I've practiced it to get it in the three minutes. Can you please restart? And, and so, and so, I'm going to ask that you start from where you left off, um, but without referencing any student in particular, without referencing violent acts. Um, what is the point that you would like to make today? That it's a miracle that my daughter's alive, and within the last week, I've heard of several instances of violence, shooting weapons, just like the lady referenced before. There was a shooting at a high school at Omaha today. You guys probably haven't even heard of yet. There was one in Georgia last week. There was one in Joppa Town. There was just an incident at Kenwood High School where a, a gun was pulled on another student. There was a fight that broke out at Lansdowne Middle School. This is all last week, today through last week. The resource officer called for help lost communication caused a frenzy with cops flying into the school this matters please don't look at me like that this does matter it, it definitely matters, matters but, but we want to ensure that the information that you are sharing at this public um, comment is accurate okay. um, and in well, some I'll of the things that you have mentioned especially um, with some specific occurrences that have occurred in ba that have allegedly occurred in baltimore county has not that has not been the case so at this time we're going to end the public comment um, and we appreciate that you came here to, to share. You're welcome to email us uh, can your your um, can your response. And so, so I'll I'll let you take a minute, finish, um, wrap up what you have to say. As long as you are not referencing a specific student, a specific occurrence or um, information about a school that is not factually correct. Okay, well, th it is factually correct because I looked everything up. I should have brought my references. I'm sorry, next month I will. I will bring every reference and have it on everyone's desk because I'm not gonna let you guys off easy. The girl that did it to my daughter, she got off easy. And school so safety needs to be changed. Cannot reference a specific st Student. I understand that, but school safety needs to change. My um, my daughter almost died. You can understand why I'm so upset right now. So thank you, Ms. Holt. Thank you for your uh, thank you for your testimony. We take school safety very seriously here in Baltimore County Public Schools. We have made record investments in safety um, in this school. And we are, we are actively working to ensure that all of our students are safely. So thank you, Ms. Holt. Thank you, Ms. Holt. Ms. Holt. Thank you, Ms. Holt. You can, you're more than welcome to email your comments directly to us. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. And for that, I call on Dr. Rogers.
Thank, thank you, Ms. Holt. Thank you, Ms. Holt. And the next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. Good evening. Thank you, uh, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, members of the board. Uh, before I get started with the report, I do want to uh, speak to everyone who is watching as well as everyone who is the gallery with us. I want to make it perfectly clear to reaffirm our commitment to safety and climate in Team BCPS. Um, we do have staff who is following up with the individual to provide support. Um, it is extremely important that all members of our community know that we take the safety of our students as well as our staff extremely important and have demonstrated that in a variety of ways uh, over the last year. First slide, please. This first slide speaks to the MCAP English Language Arts and Mathematics scores that were released on August 27th. We sent a community update out to uh, members of Team BCPS internally and externally. What you see depicted with the chart, everything that is green is an area, a, a specific marker where students made gains. Um, in their performance, you see literacy as well as mathematics. For the first time in a very long time, Baltimore County Public Schools has moved forward in terms of student progress. Additionally, as a school system, we had the second highest growth in both literacy and mathematics um, across the state of Maryland. That being said, as I have said uh, many times, um, we are working together to reverse a uh, pattern of declining performance that has occurred more over more than a decade. And so it's going to take time for us to get to where we want to be. However, I did want to take the opportunity to make sure that this information was highlighted for our community and to thank our teachers and students who are putting in the effort to move forward in a positive way focused on academics. This next slide speaks to elementary literacy. Uh, there is a conversation that is happening on the state level that should be of interest to members of Team BCPS. Specifically, the conversation is about students having the ability to read by the end of third grade. Um, on this slide, you see depicted our um, pathway to success for students to ensure that their college career and community ready. Um, we have identified since last year that reading at or above proficiency level at the end of grade three is extremely important. The state conversation is about, in a few years, um, possibly retaining students who are not able to read at the end of grade three. On this slide, you also see the data uh, from our student performance from kindergarten to grade three their performance at the beginning of the year compared to their performance at the end of the year. The green represents our students reading on or above grade level. You'll note that in all grade levels, our students demonstrated improvement in their ability to read on or at grade level. Our data showed us that students that were using Amira at, a, at least 30 minutes per week, they were experiencing much more significant gains than students that were not. And so this is a message for our communities, for our parents, for our caregivers. Uh, as Amira um, students come home and they start talking about Amira and that there are opportunities to practice at home, we're asking all families to please avail themselves to the opportunity. You will receive reports after the beginning of the year assessments that let you know exactly how your student is doing and even more important, provide some specific details about skills that you can practice at home. It is our goal to make sure that all students, uh, regardless of what elementary school they attend, regardless of ethnicity or um, student group, 
that they are reading proficiently at the end of grade three. And so we are previewing this information for our families and asking that you look forward to the information that's coming out about AMIRA and help to support your student at home and on the weekends with practicing on AMIRA. This is week three of the school year, and so we have some community reminders. Uh, the first reminder is about attendance. The most important thing that we can do as a school system is to make sure that our students are in school and that they're in school on time. We are continuing our work with the Here For It campaign, um, and we are looking to continue to reduce chronic absenteeism. We are proud of the fact that based on the hard work of all of our principals, assistant principals, staff members, and central office team, which many of them are here from our student support services this evening, that we saw significant reductions in chronic absenteeism in Baltimore County Public Schools, not only by level, by zone, by ethnicity, and by student group, um, student service group. And so we want to implore families, school is in session, we begin at the same time every day. Please set your alarm, set more than one if you need to, but we need our students on the buses or walking and in school on time. Our school bus camera safety program, the enforcement of that will begin the fine on September 27th. As a reminder, all motorists should stop for flashing red lights. That indicates that students are embarking upon the bus or disembarking upon the bus and if someone is found in violation beginning September 27th, the fine is $250 per infraction. Um, and so we are asking everyone to really be alert to the fact that we have 80,000 students that are on our buses and we have thousands more that are walking to school in the morning and in the afternoons every day. And so please uh, be aware. Rights and responsibilities, this is our second year where we have shared with all members of Team BCPS our specific expectations for student behavior at all levels around um, proper behavior in schools. Specifically, we want to highlight um, threats to schools, weapons, and fighting are three egregious behaviors that are being responded to immediately we have a strong continued partnership with the police department. SROs continue to be in our schools. We have student safety assistance in our secondary schools with a model in elementary school to provide support anywhere that it's needed, as well as now safety team leaders to provide additional support. The goal is to be proactive in having that adult presence in our schools, but also to be reactive in the event that a student makes a poor decision. We are asking for parents and guardians your help to reiterate the rights and responsibilities of Baltimore County Public Schools to your students and ask you to reach out directly to school administration should you have any questions or concerns. We also want to share we continue to expand and provide resources for all of our students around mental health. Talk space remains available for all students ages 13 and above with parent permission. And we announced an $8 million grant from the Maryland Consortium to provide direct services for uninsured and underinsured students in more than 100 of our schools. So again, families, if you need any additional supports, please reach out directly to your student's counselor, to your administrator, so we can connect you with the supports that are available at no cost to families. We have a focus on instruction and are asking that cell phones are off and away. As you know, we have a group of secondary schools that have volunteered uh, for a pilot. What's um, very important for families to know as a part of this pilot, the cell phones are accessible in cases of emergency. However, they are off and away during instruction so students and teachers can focus on the academic material. And lastly, communication. 
One of the things that we have found as we have pushed out messages over the summer and at the beginning of the school year when we received emails from families indicating that they were not aware of very important messages that we were sending out uh, far in advance, several months in advance to our families in a variety of languages, is that some families have chosen to opt out of our messaging services or to block Baltimore County Public Schools. We are asking that you opt back in and you do not block Baltimore County Public Schools as we will continue to send text messages, emails, and phone calls for not only emergencies that may occur in schools or school communities, but also important information that we want you to have. And we are working very hard to make sure that we send out information in advance as much as possible. And so we're asking that while sometimes it can be several messages for you to opt back in so you stay connected to Baltimore County Public Schools. This slide simply reiterates our commitment and our request for families to stay connected. If you have opted out and you want to know what we have sent um, to our families, please simply go to our website. You'll find there all of our press releases as well as every staff and community message that we have sent. Um, those messages are available in English and in Spanish for our families. And lastly, before concluding with my report, I want to share with you that Baltimore County Public Schools stands with the nation, recognizing that September is Attendance Awareness Month. In my possession is a proclamation for here for it, attending today to achieve tomorrow. The proclamation states, whereas students and families are more likely to show up and engage when there are positive conditions for learning at school, including physical and emotional health and safety, a sense of belonging and connection and support. Whereas reducing absence requires a comprehensive approach that starts with developing routines and trusting relationships that create a sense of belonging. Whereas improving attendance and engagement takes schools, families, elected leaders, and other community partners working together to rebuild regular and trusting communication and to identify and address barriers to being in school, whereas taking attendance daily in a caring, consistent manner is a, essential to identifying when students begin to miss too much school and for noticing as much as possible when students are starting to miss too much school and engaging students and families with needed support and resources. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Baltimore County Public Schools stands with the nation in recognizing September as Attendance Awareness Month. We hereby commit to focusing on reducing absenteeism and addressing the factors that cause students to miss school in order to ensure that all students have an equal opportunity to learn, grow, and thrive academically, emotionally, and socially. We recognize that we must work together to build an engaging school environment that motivates attendance and sends the message that learning can and must continue. So with that, I will sign the proclamation on behalf of Baltimore County Public Schools and ask that you all join me in doing our part to make sure that all of our students are in school every day on time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. <coughs> and up next we have the chair's report. And I just, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge the feeling in the room and in our community. When a student loses their life, it is a sad day and it impacts us all. Our hearts are with Harford County, our hearts are with Georgia, and our hearts are right here in Baltimore County with Franklin High School. As a board, we will continue to work collaboratively with the superintendent to keep our students safe. When you send your kids to school with us, we want them to come home safe. We want them to come home happy. We want them to come home nurtured. We want them to come home educated. And most importantly, we want them to come home alive. And so I just wanted to acknowledge the feeling in the room. I know that the public comment was heavy. 
and we absolutely care about what that parent has to say. We absolutely want all of our schools to be safe, um, and we will absolutely continue to work to make record investments in safety and security for our schools. Um, if you could put up the, the presentation. And so tonight, I wanna focus on communication. Th it's so important that the community lets us know. We wanna hear from you. We wanna provide you with accurate and complete information. And we wanna ensure that you are communicating through the, the best channels to get the most efficient and accurate information. Displayed on the screen, it's the email address of the board, the phone number of the board, and for those of you who like to mail letters, the mailing address of the board. When you email boe at bcps.org, it goes to the entire board. It doesn't just go to one board member, all of us receive it. And that allows all board members at once to hear your concerns. We share that with the superintendent for follow-up with her staff. Same thing with the phone. If you call, if you leave a voicemail, all board members will receive it, and there will be follow-up. Your voice matters, and it truly does inform our governance, our governance actions. So we want to hear from you. And I want to just ground us in some of the things that the board members commit, that what we have committed to through our board handbook. There are five commitments that we have in that handbook, and I've highlighted two of them. The first one is focusing on strategic governance and not the daily operations of the school system. The second is representing the position of the entire board, not individual opinions. So when you email us about operations and we respond to you saying, we've shared the email with the superintendent and you'll be followed up um, with the appropriate staff, it's not us blowing you off. It is actually in our policy. When you look at the end of most policies, it states the board directs the superintendent to implement this policy. And so when you get that response from us, letting you, letting you know that we've shared it with the superintendent, her staff will follow up, um, whether it's for transportation, student enrollment, curriculum concerns, staffing, exams, anything that deals with the day-to-day -day operations of a school system, of, of your school, um, it is best answered by those that, that um, address the day-to-day -day operations. When you post something on Facebook for a question to, to get a response, um, we want to ensure that you get an accurate response. And so we would ask that if, you, if you're posting something on social media, share it with the board so that we can get you an accurate and complete response and it's not um, um, any type of misinformation or misunderstandings out there. Sometimes we get requests from community members to be anonymous or from staff to be anonymous. As soon as you send an email to the board, it is you are no longer anonymous. There are only rare occasions that we do not disclose. Every, all of our emails, our correspondences, for the most part, are, um, they, are fall, they all fall under the Maryland Public Information Act. If there's a staff member that wants to be anonymous in communication, um, we encourage that they go through their, their unions. If there's a community member that wants to be anonymous in their communication, we have a, a waste, fraud, abuse um, hotline where you can be anonymous. But if you email the board member, know that you are not anonymous. And we also, as a board, agree to some norms and operating protocols. This is also in our board handbook. We agree to communicate respectfully and honestly and we also agree that there is a, a chain of command, especially for communicating with the media, elected officials, and others. And so, um, and so once again, when you communicate with us and you want a response from just that one person, um, there are some things that we have agreed to as a board and some norms and protocols that we will adhere to. And know that all board members, even if, you know, if we're elected, if we're appointed, we represent all students, all schools, all central office staff. It doesn't matter which board member you contact, you will get a response. 
And I just want to emphasize that when we make a decision, a governance decision, um, our, our District 1 representatives don't only vote for the principals that are appointed in District 1. They vote for all the principals um, that are appointed. So our decisions, although we may be elected by a specific area, our decisions are for the entire school system. You will see board members attend schools and see and visit schools that are outside of their district so that they can see what's happening and get the full scope of what's happening in the school system. And so, um, so I just wanted to emphasize that we represent all and we are working for all students in Baltimore County. And any decisions that are made are made through the vote of the majority. An individual board member does not have authority. It all comes through the vote of the majority. Even as board chair, the, my actions are through the vote of the majority. And so um, you can always email boe at bcps.org to share any information, concerns. If you want to share uh, great news, we want to hear that as well. Um, just know that we will always get back to you. We want to hear from you, and, um, and we want you to, in, to ensure that you're going through accurate channels to get the complete information you have questions. So whether if you use the BCS-approved social media accounts, website, um, staff members, such as principals, if you're at the school, your, your first line is, are your teachers, your assistant principals, your counselors, your, um, your principal. Um, there's BCPS press releases, there's emails that I know you all get. So we are just, in, we want to keep the lines of communication open. And, um, and if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact us. And with that, I will turn it over to our student board member, Ms. Chika Kalu, um, for her report. Hello. Good evening, Board Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, Superintendent Rogers, board members, dedicated staff, esteemed community members, and scholars of BCPS. First, again, with the start of the school year just two weeks ago, I would like to express how honored I am to serve as your student board member for the 24 to 25 school year. I do not take this responsibility lightly, and I'm deeply grateful for your trust in me. So just this morning, I attended the Aspen Education Cross-Partisan Policy Network conference in Washington, D.C., where I sat on the panel, the Student Movement for Representation in Education. The heart of the conversation was that while students may be invited to speak, we must ensure that their presence leads to meaningful dialogue and action. This is precisely what I strive to achieve here in Baltimore County, ensuring that our students don't just have a seat at the table, but that their voices guide the decisions that shape our schools. One, qu one quote resonated with me. When we integrate students' voices, are we allowing them to be collaborators co-creating their education, or are they merely the subject of our conversation? Also, I want to thank Dr. Rogers for her continued commitment to engaging with our students through school visits, reaching over 20 schools in the first week, and for the opportunity to accompany her. It's one thing to discuss policy here in this room, but it is another thing to see firsthand how those policies impact our students day to day. Now, I am more excited than ever to start my own small visits in just a few weeks, walking the halls and hearing directly from the students I serve. I will also be returning to Carroll County tomorrow to continue advocating for small voting rights, a crucial issue for me and every student who believes in the power of their voice and perspectives in the highest level of decision making. However, tonight, as we've heard, rec have we just recently heard, I also want to acknowledge the tragedy at Joppa Town High School, as well as many, too many other states and regions. My deepest sympathies, sympathies go out to the victims, their families, and all those who have been impacted by this act of violence. It's incredibly disheartening to witness yet another loss and a future, another loss and a future to needless act of violence. In a statement released collaboratively by all SMOBs across Maryland, we wrote, thoughts and prayers are not enough. Every student deserves to learn in an environment free from fear. This tragedy underscores why I'm looking into the creation of a student school safety advisory board within BCPS a space where students can directly, can directly and actively engage in creating safety solutions and provide input on security measures that effectively, that directly affect their lives. Hope to possibly propose this as an upcoming meeting as I've already reached out through social media to students across the county, conducting polls to gauge their interest and involvement. Out of 300 students reached, 80 expressed a strong desire to join such an advisory board and an additional 150 indicated that they would want to see this implemented. This is more than just a policy initiative. It's a movement to protect the lives of our students and continue to uphold BCPS's commitments and efforts to ensure that their safety is prioritized above all else. 
We owe it to them to take action. I am committed to doing everything in my power alongside our entire school system to make this a reality. But on a lighter note, I've, I've launched a back to school video series, which was a fun way to engage with students and energize them for the year ahead. And I'm also working on mental health, a mental health campaign for Suicide Prevention Month this September, a three week social media series titled Piece by Piece to raise awareness and provide support for BCPS students who may be struggling. Looking forward, I'm working to structure town halls, seminars, and student panels to gather diverse feedback from all corners of our community. I cannot stress to students how excited I am to get to work and hear from as many as you as possible. It's only been two weeks since school began, but students, I want you to know that I am here for you. I am with you, walking through the same hallways and facing the same challenges. I'll continue to be present and to listen because your voices truly do matter. And I'm going to take a quick moment here for a shameless plug. So this is also my official advertisement for students to apply for the Baltimore County Student Council Committees and the Board of Selected Students. BOSS and BCSC is an opportunity to have your voice heard, collaborate with peers, and help shape the future of education in Baltimore County. Whether you're passionate about policy, <coughs> school culture, expanding small engagement, or mental health, there is truly a place for you here. So please do not waste students. BOSS applications close September 18th and committee applica applications close September 20th. Once again, I want to express how happy I am to be serving you in this capacity. Students, you have truly amazed me in the two weeks I've been with you, and while you may not hear it enough, you truly are excellent. I want to thank you for showing up because as Dr. Roger said, we're here. <laughs> Sorry, that was corny. We're, we're here for it. <laughs> but <laughs> thank you for your class. Thank you for showing up to your classes, showing up for your communities, and for one another. Know that we see you and we appreciate every effort you make to be present and engaged. Keep that same energy because we are going to achieve incredible things this year. As we move forward into the school year, my goals still remain clear. To amplify your voices, to work tirelessly for your safety and well-being, and to ensure that every student in Baltimore County finds their place in this puzzle, feeling seen, heard, and valued. I wish you the best of luck as we continue on this journey together, and I look forward to the amazing things we will accomplish this year. Continue to shine, and thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the consideration of the proposed FY 2026 state capital budget request. And for that, I call on Dr. Grimm and Mr. Hartlove. Good evening, Board Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. We're here this evening asking for your approval of the FY 26 a state capital budget request. May I have a motion to approve the FY 2026 state capital budget request as presented in Exhibit J? So moved, Humphrey. May I have a second? Second, Savoy. Any discussion? Ms. Hinn. Yes, I have a couple of questions regarding the prioritization, if I may ask of staff. Thank you. Good evening, gentlemen. Um, in looking at the 25 capital, state capital budget request as compared to this year's request, I noticed there were some changes in the prioritization. Good evening. Yes. Um, would you be able to speak to the changes in prioritization of this year's state capital request over last year's? Um, with I regards don't have to the, the top last year's right in front of me. Um, um, but I have copies if you'd like to refer to this. Specifically with the um, top five projects. Sure. It looks um, like Towson was added and some of the others, the Northeast Area High School and there's Point Middle and High School okay. projects. The Prioritization, um, I think it was partially with which project we were asking for funding for, for the other, like if you look at the prioritization of the 25 budget, there were a lot of planning requests. Um, right now, like we, our design for Towson and Delaney are progressing to a point that we really need to get funding. We were not in a point to, that we couldn't get it last year, mm -hmm. so as a, and priority for this budget, that's our number one priority. So that's why those moved up. Okay. Um, we have Patapsco, the design of Patapsco is also um, 
progressing. I'm not sure with the cash flow how what what we're going to get on that um, with the amount without having BPL funds this year, but that moved up to three. Um, the CTE center is as well. We're asking for planning um, for that. The design is underway as well. Um, we're not asking for funding, but we th that'll help with. Um, the, the design fees on it um, th to be able to do that. Um, the the, the pre-planning is so something that they just started um, last year. This is, it used to be just planning and funding. Now they have pre-planning. Mm -hmm. And it's more of, a, it gives you a little bit of money to start to really um, narrow in on what your projects are. And so last year, I think we had the, um, we knew about the, Hold on. North Hysteria High was priority one, mm -hmm. and now like we know that's going to be overly, so now we have that, that now as priority six. Um, and then the Southeast, we're trying to figure out what we were going to do and where we were going to do it. Now we, we're progressing into knowing it's going to be Sparrows Point, but we're not ready to start designing it yet. We're still in the pre-planning, so that's how where that came, so that's number five. Um, okay. So the, yeah, they, each one depends on where they are in the cycle of the particular project. Okay. So and then some of the systemic, just like at the, at the end from seven to 18, mm -hmm. six of them were, were on, came over from, from the 25 budget. The priorities sometimes change because every year we look at it to see which ones we really you know, need and we work with our maintenance people. So that's how that changed. Sure. So is it a true statement then to say that the overall project timeframes haven't changed but where each one is in the cycle, if I understood Dr. Grimm's comment, is overall the same. It's yes. just a matter of what we're requesting depending on where each is in the cycle. That's correct. Changed. Yeah, we okay. tried to right size that's it. That's correct. Sure. And then it looked like based on the state's reporting and the IAC's reporting that we received 250000 each for the Northeast High School project as well as Sparrows Point. But according to the request, the 250000 isn't reflected on that spreadsheet. I, I think I made a handwritten note there. Yeah. Um, and that, that's all part of it. And we're, some of the numbers before that we're trying to, f to work on are cash flows, and mm -hmm. some of the numbers may change a little bit. Then we can come back and we'll, we'll you know, put the final. Uh, but it's accurate that we received that same amount planning for yeah. both of those projects. Yes, there wouldn't be a different amount. Yep. Okay, because it wasn't reflected on there. So I wanted to make sure that I was comparing the same projects mm -hmm. because now Sparrows Point is identified in the IAC's reporting as Southeast Middle High School. I was pretty sure it was the same project, yeah. but we're just calling it something else. Okay, I think that's all I had. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. McNeil. Now, it appears that, did the board vote in January of 24 to move this overly project above Sparrows Point? I don't understand how the Northeast has come about over Spares Point. So it's it's not a matter of coming over or, or above. It's where they are in the cycle of either the plan, the design, the construction of the of the project, where they are, and also not only where how they're being funded, not only through the state but through the county and where we anticipate all of the dollars coming from for any particular project. As Ms. Lazari said, sometimes we're using built to learn funds, sometimes we have additional grant funding. So we have, we have not changed um, how we approach these projects except for some of the systemics, which are chillers, boilers, roofs, things that we have to look at there. As far as our larger construction projects, we have, we have not changed what the priority order is. You'll also notice, um, for example, we are we are underway with the, the the Dundalk edition. You don't see that reflected on here because that's already been funded in other ways. So it's imp it's important to note that depending on where a project is in the in the cycle of our projects, how much funding we may request at a particular time or what it's being used for. But someone without getting the explanation you just gave would look at this and it says request by priority order. Mm -hmm. So. 
to me that and I saw number one northeast area high and that like came that you know that spares point was right up in there with with the Dunda or with Delaney and Towson and those and now this one's here Mr. Rebellion, thank you for your comment. We'll be happy to share that with the state and how we, how we request and we report out um, what our projects are. Um, it's also important to note that, that when the state receives our request, they choose what they're gonna fund. So we can, we can give them a list or an order as much as, as we want, but they also can make a determination about what and how much they're gonna fund a particular project. So even though we request a certain amount from them or we put it in as part of our prioritization, they can come back and say, for example, with Blueprint, they, they, it's possible that the IAC will say, we are, we are gonna pri reprioritize your requests because we, we are, as a state will fund pre-K seats before we fund something else. So under, understanding that our funding partners in this, whether the state or the county, are the ones that control the purse, purse strings, so to speak, um, they can also adjust some of the quote unquote priority order on specific projects. Okay, and just to carry it now, I'm looking at the January 23rd, 2024 priority, mm -hmm. or, uh, priority mm -hmm. order. The second one's uh, Southeast area, middle school or high school. If we carry that all the way across, it, it, so we are asking the state for $125,066,000. Is that correct? So, Mr. McMillian, you're referring to the county capital budget request, which was passed in January. We're, we're talking about the state request for funding. So it, you're, it, I don't want to say you're comparing apples and oranges, but w there's a difference between what the county will fund for us and what the state will fund. The state funding is in part dependent on um, on what the IAC looks at in terms of, of our SRCs, and on some projects, the county is more um, more willing to devote county funds to projects versus others. So you're referring to the county priority list versus the state priority list. So those are two different budgets, and so the so the priorities may appear different because not the same schools are on both lists. Because some are funded in, in, um, greater, uh, in a greater way by the state and some are funded through grants. So for example, on the, the county capital budget request priority that you're looking at for January 23rd, you will notice that Towson High School is not listed, okay? Towson High School is listed on the state request and it's also because we're using built to learn funding for that particular project, okay? So I hope that helps. I know it's, it's very confusing, mm -hmm. um, but that's why we have to look in totality at all of our funding requests and that's why we, we, we provide both documents. Okay, so let's go back to that $125 million. So for we've which, already asked for which, the state for, for which project, <laughs> Mr. McMillian, I'm sorry. The, the county one. Okay, for which, for which project? For the southeast area, middle school or high school. Mm -hmm. We slide over and the darker the brown columns, mm -hmm. it's $125,066,000. State funding request for 25. So we've asked them for that already. We've asked the county, we've asked the county for that. Right. Okay, next to county. it is total county funding at $86 mm -hmm. million. Dollars. Mm -hmm. The state has not, the state is not giving us funding for that yet. We're not ready with the design. That's right. it's, it, we need to be at a certain point in the design to, to get state money for funding. Mm -hmm. And they, we're not there. And also Towson and Delaney funding was ahead of it. So it didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So the total for that was $211 million. So what, what in that columns, so if the c total county funding is 86 and the state funding is 125, that comes out to $211 million, 977. So I'm trying to understand this. Thanks for your patience in dealing with no me. No problem. Appreciate it. Any other questions? Okay. May I have a motion to approve, well, we may I have, a, wait, do we already do the roll, do we already do the second? Yeah. 
We did. Okay. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Chickacalla? Yes. Ms. Dulesky? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call on Ms. Devasti Jones. Uh, good evening, board members. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session and took action on the following case, HE 2432. Now would be an appropriate time for the board to confirm the action taken in closed session. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner's case 24-32 and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present, but everyone is? So oh, moved. Okay. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yep. May I have, um, so so moved, Stileski. May I have a second? Second, Chike Kalu. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Hen? Abstain. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Chika Kalu? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is contract awards, and for that I call on Mr. Young, Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Members of the board, the board's Building and Contracts Committee met on Monday, September 9th, 2024. Items L1 through L16 were forwarded to the full board for approval. Thank you, Mr. Young. Um, board members, are there any separation requested? Mr. Young. If we could separate separate out L4, please. L4. Any others? Okay. Do I have a motion to approve items L1 through L3 and L5 through L16? So move, Lichter. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from committee. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Chikakalu? Yes. Ms. Dulesky? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. Do I have a motion to approve item L4? So moved, Stileski. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Chikakalu? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Recused. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is consideration of the special project request for Riderwood Elementary School, and for that I call on Dr. Jones. Good evening, Board Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, and members of the board. I am here to request the approval in collaboration with Blue Water Baltimore. Permission is sought to plant 19 one and a half caliper native trees and 63 three gallon restoration trees on the Riderwood Elementary School property. Do I have a motion to approve the privately funded 7330 project request for Riderwood Elementary School's tree planting project as presented in Exhibit M? So move, Pumphrey. Do I have a second? Second, Hen. Any discussion? <coughs> May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Chikakalu? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on budget, fiscal responsibility, 
Blueprint Pillars 1 and 2. And, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll wait for uh, Dr. Rogers. I have one too. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we are going to take a five minute recess and we will be back. Wait, I, he I hear some heels. No, okay, so we're going to take a five minute uh, recess. We will be back here um, at 8.19. We will come back from recess. Thank you all again for your patience. And we will dive right into the budget report blueprint pillars one and two. Thank you. Good evening again, uh, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, members of the board. For this presentation, the team will talk about the budgetary implications of blueprint for Maryland's future pillars one and two. Um, as a reminder, uh, second slide please. As a reminder, pillar one is focused on early childhood education while pillar two is focused on high quality and diverse teachers and leaders across Team BCPS. Uh, part of pillar one, next slide please is the mandate for all school systems to expand publicly funded full day pre-K. Um, it is well documented the impact that full day pre-K has on students, not only their levels of learning while they're in school, but also their lifetime learning, uh, lifetime earning potential. Pillar two, next slide, speaks to highly effective staff focused on teachers and leaders. The two quotes here, um, speak to the impact of not only teachers in every classroom having a high quality teacher, but also the impact of an effective principal. Uh, both of those uh, are qu high quality indicators on academic achievement for students and ensuring that there's a professional learning culture that really focuses on development of teacher, effectiveness of students, and retention of teachers so that they can continue to move forward and improve their practice. For us, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 represent a large portion of the FY25 budget. Um, if you'll note on this slide, um, Pillar 1 for early childhood education, the number of dollars, the increase over FY24 budget was $14.2 million, while for Pillar 2, highly effective staff, that was $40.9 million. Uh, just to give everyone an idea on how impactful Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 were on the FY25 budget, all the other changes uh, net was $12.3 million. And so you're able to see uh, whether you're looking at the pie chart or the table on the budgetary impact on really focusing on the expansion of pre-K that has long-term impact on our school system and the learning of our students, as well as highly effective staff that we need all of our staff members to make those decisions 
on a regular basis to um, educate our students. And so with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to the rest of the team that will walk everyone through a reminder, high level reminder of what the pillar, requ pillar requires and our chief financial officer will speak to the financial implications for the school system. So pillar 1.1 is the expansion of fully of full day pre-kindergarten. Um, and this slide really shows you uh, tier one students um, for both three-year-olds and four-year-olds, the indicators that are examined to identify who is prioritized for enrollment for school. So families with incomes less than or equal to 300% of the federal poverty level, as well as students um, requiring special education services, those students who are identified as a potential multilingual learners, as well as those students who might be experiencing homelessness um, or in a foster care situation are identified as tier one. So we have an obligation beginning in FY23 to prioritize full day pre-kindergarten um, seats for those students. As we moved into FY25, the goal is truly to expand our ability to offer full day pre-K for more students, looking at our tier two students. And so you see the eligibility criteria there for those students. Part of the full day pre-K options is to have not only our public school pre-K programs, but also our private providers who are MSD approved and identified as blueprint pre-K full day providers to expand those partnerships so that we're providing uh, options for families. Um, the little map on the side, you can see where uh, we've expanded during uh, the past school year. So for FY25, um, increasing 19 uh, full day programs in the west side of the county, 22 in the east, and eight in the central area. The identification of sites of where programs um, are prioritized to open align with the tiers of students within that geographic area, knowing that um, we do need to provide um, as many full day options to our students who meet that tier one eligibility criteria. This slide shows um, the number of seats that we have um, both in uh, FY24 with our half day programs um, and moving forward. So if you can, the highlight is really the full day uh, pre-K programs as we look like F from FY23 to 24-25, our expansion. So in FY23, we had six schools um, that had a total of 15 sections. That means some of those schools had two or three full day classrooms in it. Moving forward to last school year where we had 24 schools with 41 sections. And then where we are currently for uh, this school year, FY25, with 55 schools um, and 101 sections of full day pre-kindergarten. When we look at uh, 20 to 22 students per class, um, that's where we have the number of available seats at uh, just over 2,000. Um, this year we have experienced um, many schools uh, that have our full day pre-kindergarten program unable to accommodate um, all of the students who meet that tier one eligibility criteria. Um, and we're very grateful for our partnership with um, our team members in the Office of Transportation who have really worked with us to make sure that we can then transport students to the nearest um, full day pre-K uh, site that may have an available seat. Um, we do have some uh, pre-K programs that um, are operating at 22 students in a class versus 20, which was our prioritized ratio. Um, however, we are able to go up with that. And again, the staffing within our pre-kindergarten classes, there's a full-time teacher, a full-time paraeducator, a full-time additional adult assistant, as well as a uh, 0.5 special educators allocated to the schools that have those full-time programs as we're really trying to optimize providing um, more inclusive opportunities for our students whenever possible um, as we're expanding to those full day program options. Okay, <laughs> so here you can see how we're really working to transform our services um, for our pre-kindergarten students. So again, uh, those full day programs, um, ensuring that we have an additional dedicated 0.5 special educator to those programs. So again, really looking at how are we proactively providing services and supports to students as an early intervention, even prior to identification. And for those students who are identified as receiving special education services, looking at how we might be able to serve them within our neighborhood schools. Um, however, again, still offering the full continuum of services to students but whenever possible, being able to provide those services within their neighborhood schools. 
Again, I talked a little ahead of the slide. Uh, the <laughs> staff to student ratio, uh, the three adults uh, to 20 students. Um, and again, really trying to focus on how are we able to provide services to students um, within their neighborhood school to the fullest extent possible, um, really focusing on creating that community environment for the students where they are going to hopefully continue to matriculate within their elementary school and then continue within BCPS within their feeder pattern. And just to, um, to back up what uh, Dr. DiDonato said with the dollars, uh, in, the, in the FY25 uh, budget, the increase uh, that went towards um, pre-kindergarten was $14.2 million, which represented 21% of the total increase. So it's a very sizable um, commitment to pre-kindergarten and to expanding pre-kindergarten. You can see the, the breakdown, 10.3 million for, um, for 147.8 FTE positions that are detailed there, and then another 3.9 for special education support for full day pre-kindergarten expansion, and that's 72.5 FTE. So very significant investment um, in pre-kindergarten in FY25, and more than likely uh, that's gonna ramp up in the, in the coming uh, budget years as well. So now we'll switch gears a little bit to um, to pillar one and two, I'm sorry, two would be after one. Um, and we'll do that. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jill Snell and I am the manager of educator um, development. I'm also our district's national board certification coordinator. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about our national board certification program, which is one part of pillar two. So it is one way that we are trying to assure that there is um, a highly accomplished teacher in all of our schools. This slide probably looks familiar to a lot of you. I came and spoke to you last year um, during the, blue, the pillar two presentation. Um, so this slide really just encompasses and shows all the work that we're doing in um, Baltimore County around national board certification. It is, there are a lot of layers from uh, recruitment uh, to then getting folks enrolled and making sure that they have all of the required documents in. Then once we get them enrolled, making sure that um, we've processed all of their payment, all their payment information so that they can get that scholarship um, that is the fee incentive program um, that's provided through MSDE and VCPS, and then supporting them throughout the three to five years that it takes them to earn national board certification. And then once they earn national board certification, we're still not done with them, then we train them to become professional learning facilitators who then go back to then supporting our national board certif certified um, candidates or nas national board certification candidates. So there's lots of layers to the program. And then if you go ahead to the next slide, thanks Carla, uh, you'll see that there's also lots of layers to the funding. Um, and so just to kind of give you some ideas of where we've been and where we're going. So back in 2021, 2022, we had 67 total national board certified teachers here in VCPS. Um, we currently have 105, and in December, so put all the positive vibes out for our candidates who submitted their assessment and are awaiting the results of those assessments in December, but we're anticipating, based off of the number of folks that applied and our pass rate, that we should be adding another 70 or 75 National Board certified teachers um, to our total numbers. Um, for the fee incentive program, so that's that scholarship that I mentioned. Um, you can see back in 21, 22, we were around $7,000 um, that we had invested in the fee incentive program, which what that does is that pays for all of their assessment fees. So for a candidate, they're only on the hook for the $75 registration fee, and then everything else regarding their, their assessment fees is taken care of for them. Um, over time, you can see that that um, financial investment has increased as the number of candidates and the number of educators pursuing national board certification has increased. And this year, we have um, 485 educators in BCPS working on national board certification. So we anticipate over the next three to five years really increasing our numbers even more. Um, but we're always recruiting, so if you know anyone who wants to earn national board certification, I'm their person, so have them reach out to me. It's just jsnell, no numbers, at bcps.org. 
Um, and then the last part that um, I will talk about because it's the cost for the training. So once we get them enrolled in the fee incentive program, um, which is again is that scholarship and they're working on their national board certification, then we need to provide some support along the way. So there's me and then I have a team of two um, that are um, central supports for national board um, candidates. But then we also um, pay our currently um, national board certified educators as professional learning facilitators to support our candidates who are pursuing. Um, you can see over the last few years that's been funded in different ways. So started with Title II, then Maryland Leads. Um, we all know that Maryland Leads wasn't available for this year. So MSDE offered the opportunity to apply for grant funding. And we were super excited to learn about a month ago that our grant that we submitted was fully funded. So this year our pr um, professional development support for our uh, candidates will be funded through a grant um, through MSDE. Uh, it's also important for you to know, and then I'll turn it over to you for the salaries, um, that once an educator earns national board certification, um, that they, as long as they meet the minimum teaching requirements, that they are then eligible for a $10,000 salary enhancement, so that's on top of their salary. And then if they are teaching in one of our 34 low-performing schools, so their blueprint identified low-performing schools, then they are eligible for a $17,000 salary enhancement. So at that point, I could turn things over to you where you can talk about the salaries. <laughs> sure, just the, at the bottom of this slide, I'm just gonna cover that part. You can see the ramp up of the investment in the, uh, in the cost for the, the wages. This is just the NBC uh, add-on that, that uh, Jill um, spoke to. Um, so we'll talk about the other part of Pillar 2 now. So let's, let's go to the next slide. Good evening, can you hear me? <laughs> I'm Carla Simons, Manager of Certification in the Division of Human Resources. Um, I work very closely with Jill uh, on National Board and helping to build this career ladder. So just a quick reminder, you might have been familiar with this slide from last year when Jill and I also came to talk to you about um, Pillar 2. Um, the uh, career ladder implementation plan for Baltimore County was submitted to the AIB on July 1st, 2024. Um, they requested feedback from us and we, it has been resubmitted and we're waiting a response from them. But the plan includes what has been negotiated for by with TAPCO for levels one to three. Um, in the next slide, I'll show you how that salary plays out uh, in a theoretical example, um, just so you can see, you know, exactly the dollars behind um, an example of, of such kind. Um, so this year, the Career Ladder Development Board and the work group will be working together to establish level four. Um, and level four, we have many considerations um, to work out um, that particularly, potentially, impacts the reorganization of the school day, um, the master schedule, um, and educator roles and responsibilities. So um, we have a lot of work of us ahead of us this school year. Um, to help us with that work, we received a grant through the AIB as a technical assistance grant, um, which the AIB provided to local school systems to support them and provide guidance with implementing the blueprint. So we requested uh, support for the career ladder portion of the blueprint, and we were matched with an organization, um, a strategic partner, who is the National Center on Education and the Economy. So they will be guiding us through this level four work. So again, these are uh, theoretical examples, and the numbers were provided by to us by the Office of Fiscal Services. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, so the career ladder level one through three uh, again was negotiate was approved and um, level four is under negotiation through TABCO. Um, so level one, all teachers can receive a 60,000 because they must have a bachelor's degree. Um, there's no additional salary for teachers on levels one and two. Um, but as the teacher achieve or determines their candidacy through Jill, um, they move to level two. Um, and on level two, they're working towards their national board certification. 
um, individuals on the master's, master's equivalency salary lane on step U on the TAPCO scale would earn $71,901. If they hold an active MBC, they qualify for an additional $10,000. Um, teachers who are placed on the master's plus 30 lane on step K, for example, earns $92,645 with, and if they hold an active NBC, um, they qualify for $10,000, thus making $102,645 annually. You can continue on and see, same for masters plus 60, someone on step F would be eligible for 100, 160,951 with an additional 10,000. So let me also add that additional 10,000, they must hold the National Board Certificate and also be teaching 60% of their uh, work time. So that's direct instruction with students. Um, if a teacher um, is assigned to a low performing school, they receive an additional 7,000 on top of the 10. And it is a MSDE identified low performing school. I'll pass it back over to Chris. Um, well, thank you, uh, Carla. So basically, we'll, you know, we'll start off with um, our, our objective, allocation of resources, as you saw in the first slide that the superintendent talked about. 61% of the new money that we received this year went towards, um, went towards uh, Pillar 2. Uh, so big, uh, significant investment in dollars. It was a total of $40.9 million went to uh, this pillar. That includes the one point, uh, approximately 1.5 for the NBC um, um, add-on. So uh, the, uh, there are two things that were uh, mandated by the state to do. We've met both of them already, so we're, a, we're really ahead um, of, of most of the folks in the state. There was a mandatory 10% teacher salary increase. We achieved that actually last year. It was due to be done this year. We were ahead, a year ahead there. Uh, minimum starting salary of $60,000. Uh, as you've seen, that's, we're, we're already there. You, you board is well aware because you voted for it. And, uh, and we were supposed to be there by 7-1-26. We actually got there by 7-1-24. So we are, it's a shame we can't say we're number one in the state, but we're, we're a leader in the state. We have very, very competitive salaries. Um, and uh, we, so we're already at uh, 60. We are the second highest in the state, as I said, and we have a three-year negotiated agreement that um, I think uh, the, our employees, um, it's, I think it's helpful for morale and for attracting highly uh, qualified, diverse uh, uh, staff. So that's, uh, that's kind of what our goals are. And here is our, where we've been the last several years. And I will just, as kind of the last slide we have here, as you can see, uh, at look, kind of looking at uh, four years of data, our base year of 22, 23, all the way through um, uh, next year, 25, 26 year, school year. Um, and you can see the bachelor's uh, year one, step uh, AA, master's step U, and the master's plus 30, all three of these areas of the, of the scale are increasing significantly, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars over the course of a three year. It's you know, with your base year, three increases off of that. So significant um, increases. And we also have achieved uh, compression, which is something that the, that the TABCO union is very interested in shrinking the, the number of steps it takes to get to the top of the scale. So we've achieved quite a lot and we have quite a lot um, that we're, we're, we're looking to achieve. And with that, we, uh, we thank you and we open it up for questions on both Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. Thank you. Um, I'll start with Mr. McMillian. Ms. Snell, I think this is for you possibly. Uh, you know, I'm a retired teacher. 15, 20 years ago, I looked at the National Board Certification, but, but it was too much work for me. I had enough to do. So I, did, so I didn't really get into it, but I just looked at it briefly and I moved on. Uh, I became aware this summer that a critical piece of this is the teacher collecting 
research or original data from the classes that they work with. Agreed? And, and then a, a critical piece is in the next year. So they're, they're going to collect this data over several different years, and then they present it to the national board. So it, it's like showing their effectiveness as a teacher, how much mm -hmm. the kids are improving in the classroom or whatever, according to the TET scores. Because they're demonstrating accomplished teaching, right? Okay. And accomplished teaching should include continuous cycles of collecting data, analyzing data, making instructional decisions based on that data, collecting more data and coming back to it and changing, adjusting as you need. So that is that is the mark of an accomplished teacher and that's what essentially national board certification is, um, is acknowledging or that teachers are submitting their performance assessments to show. So of course it would be a part of that process. Okay, so for a, th a three or four year period they're collecting this data? So they can actually do it in a year. So if they, if they want to do all four in a year, then they could do it in a year, but they now would have three to five. if it continues over to a second year, a critical piece of this, what I became aware of this summer, is getting the classes that they need. So if they start it with this particular group, age group or grade group or whatever, level, mm -hmm. and then the next year, if they don't get those classes that are, s are similar kind of, then their data is no good. They can't, they need that s those same type of sections, whether it's algebra one or whatever it is. So, Yes, and um, so they would be completing an, an entire component in one year. So they would have what they needed to submit for that one component and they would be fine. Now the next year, let's say that they were out of assignment. While it's not ideal, it doesn't prevent them from moving forward or continuing with their national board certification. Again, it's not an ideal situation, but we also recognize that sometimes that's not something that we can avoid, unfortunately. Um, and so there are still ways that they can continue with their national board certification, even if they were moved out or away from the class that they were working with during the year that they started or any year that they were working on it. And it, it, they don't have to stay with the same kids. No. It's just the sections mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the subject matter that they're teaching. Right, because if you think about, you know, you're a third grade teacher, their kids change year to year and they would stay in third grade potentially. So no, it doesn't have to be the same group of kids year to year. Yeah, I was thinking of a high school, middle school where mm -hmm. the sections move on and they're teaching that same whatever that class is. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Ms. Snell. Good questions. Any other questions? Ms. Rimpong. So thank you for the presentation this evening. So I was looking at the fiscal impact and um, it speaks to that on slide five. So with pillar one, we hear about 14.2 million, and then pillar two is 40.9 million. But as we've gone through the presentation for pillar one, it is like one component of pillar one. So um, if we're talking about expanding the publicly funded full day pre-K for all four-year-olds, et cetera. Um, the other items then that are listed on pillar one um, from the Maryland Blueprint as well as pillar two, because for pillar two we heard about the career ladder, but there's also things on creating a more educator, more diverse educator workforce and other items under pillar two. Where, I guess, where do we, what do we anticipate the fiscal impacts of those? Because those also fall under pillar one and pillar two. Yeah, that, that's a good question. That'll, that will be determined as we go forward in, in future budget years. As we, as we address those items, we'll quantify what they cost and, and, and um, attribute them to the, the, the pillar that they're supporting. Um, but the, uh, certainly the, the, uh, the concentration the, uh, of dollars are going towards these high priority areas. So when we talk about the fiscal impact then, it is just you're saying it's for this year. And so when we start to look at then for other monies, for other um, of these components in pillar one and pillar two, we have to wait till another year. Right, and well, w these are very generalized. I mean, these, these dollar, we, our budget is very complex. There's a lot of small items. Um, so uh, there are, 
in that uh, all other changes, there may have been a few other things that actually contributed, but we were really concentrating on pre-K in pillar one. Uh, the staff, I believe that the staffing dollar amount is right. That is the cost of the, of the, of the package, the salary package that we went forward with. Um, but the pillar one may have picked up some, a few other items in there as well um, that we could, uh, uh, but this we, we were concentrating on early childhood for this presentation. Okay, so then for pillar two, which is high quality and diverse teachers and leaders, I didn't hear anything in pillar two pertaining to what the diversity efforts were. So for that 40.9 million, are there monies allotted for the diversity efforts, or again, are we waiting until another year for that? I, I'm not the best to speak to what our, effort, what our efforts are. This, this dollar amount is truly, truly uh, the salary portion, but I know we're making other we're making other um, uh, efforts on that, and uh, the perfect person just walked up. <laughs> perfect, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, thank you for the question. As a matter of fact, as a part of our recruitment efforts and, and um, building a more diverse um, uh, workforce, particularly around teachers, uh, that is part of our recruitment efforts in terms of the, um, not only the salaries being more competitive, but then also the addition of that 10,000 and the 7,000 for those uh, individuals who achieve national board certification, but then those who are going to, who agree to commit to work in our uh, more challenging schools. Um, so that is part of our recruitment efforts, but then we also have um, other um, areas in which we are working uh, with funding from Title II to also assist with our recruitment as we go out to um, our um, HBCUs or even some of our um, diverse diversity events that we also are using to recruit um, more diverse um, uh, candidate pool. And, and uh, just one little thing. So when we, we uh, talked about the dollars that we put in to get our salary, starting salary up to $60,000, that certainly can be part of a recruiting effort. You know, th it, that it goes out to everyone, but that certainly can be helpful for the HR staff to be able to recruit diverse candidates because if everyone's interested in a competitive salary, so that helps to attract uh, good candidates. I think the other part of recruitment is also the retention, and we know that staff who feel supported in schools, who have mentors, who have consulting teachers who are helping coach them, who are receiving high quality professional development, who feel that they can be successful in the classroom are more likely to stay. So the other sort of softer elements that are happening are with the consulting teacher support, with mentoring programs within the schools, with looking at our staff development teachers that was part of our budget to allocate to every school so that there was there were staff on site to do coaching and support with teachers because those first critical months of school, feeling successful, feeling confident, accessing curriculum, knowing how to use the materials. So tying all those pieces together with the summer professional development, the coaching that we can offer within the school, and the professional development that we can offer ongoing throughout the school year are all parts of helping ensure that our teachers are feeling confident and able to deliver high quality instruction, which again, makes them want to stay with us. I would just add to that, um, if, I, if I may, okay. Um, so when you look at our blueprint, BCPS's blueprint implementation plan, um, because I, I, don't, I don't want it to appear like there isn't a, um, an explicit, um, um, there aren't explicit strategies around not just hiring, but hiring a diverse workforce. So um, I think what I am hearing you say is that you're also wondering about the fiscal impact of um, hiring strategies like ones listed in the blueprint plan around partnering with historically black colleges and universities um, to participate in their college fairs, conducting col classroom visits at colleges and universities where BCPS has built relationships with faculty and staff, particularly HBCUs, using Handshake, um, expanding professional development, um, school partnerships, so expanding our PDS partnerships with our um, local HBCUs, um, auditing and um, reviewing the teacher screening tool for um, implicit bias. So um, are you asking for, um, like, what is the fiscal impact of those specific strategies as well as national board certification and then career ladder salaries? Correct, so is it that's is so. the recruitment okay. and the retention, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Ms. Dominowski, and then Ms. Hint. Just real quick. So um, 
question. Uh, prior to the incentives with the national board certifications, how many nationally board certified teachers did we have on staff? That's a great question. So, because I only had that until um, 2021, 2022. Oh, could you speak into the mic? Yes. <laughs> Okay, we're so close. <laughs> um, I only have back till 21, 22. I know that data exists somewhere. Um, I don't know it off the top of my head, um, but 21, 22 is on here because that's the first year of the salary enhancement. So I get what you're saying. Like, what is it? What did it look like before that? Mm. Now I will say that because it takes at least a year, minimal a year, and that's rare that somebody completes it in a year, and it does take two to three years, um, that 67 is probably a good indicator because in that first year, if they were going to be attracted by the salary, they would have just started it in that year because that's when the salary enhancement started to be promoted and was available. Okay. So if any teachers were nationally board certified before this incentive started, would they also receive an incentive if they're that makes sense. So as long as their certification is current. Okay. Um, and then, so there used to be what was called a renewal, is what they used to call it, what, which National Board used to call it. So if your National Board certification expired, uh, and it used to be every 10 years, and every 10 years you would have to go through a renewal process. The renewals um, stopped in 2020, and then they started a um, maintenance of certification in 2021. So anybody who had a current um, National Board certification, they are eligible for the salary enhancement. And starting next year, there is also a salary enhancement on top of the 10 or 17 for all those that are maintaining. So if you hold a National Board certification and then you maintain your certification, that's another salary enhancement that kind of stacks on top. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, my last question uh, kind of pertains to the slide 15. I noticed that uh, the compensation when we hit the low level, middle, high, and when you start at the low, you have a 1.7% increase, and then the two higher ones were 3.11. Was that something that the, the unions negotiated, that they'd rather have the higher end? That I it's, it's a multi-year um, answer to that because the, you have to kind of work with the structure that you inherited, but y that I everything that we have here is, was negotiated. They didn't specifically want the smaller raises, but we were kind of locked into what we inherited when we started the negotiations. So it's not a goal to, to, to have lower raises, but I think what, what's happened is because we've pushed the starting salary up um, significantly, some of the some of the other steps, it kind of pushed it closer to some of the other steps, so then those raises in the first year weren't, aren't, aren't, as, aren't as high, if that makes sense. For the, for the starting salary, mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not as high. Yes, but that's something, that's something that um, they're also, because we're talking about compressing the scale and all that, there were other things that, were, that they were trying to accomplish, getting to the top quicker for a new teacher. Uh, as opposed to taking 30 years, now it's 25 years. So those are all things that come in negotiations. But um, so y the answer to your question is yes, it was negotiated. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Hare. Thank you. Um, so going back to our build out of pre-K capacity, I'm interested in the pacing and how our utilization of our current capacity compares to the capacity that we've built. Because as you said, Mr. Hartlove, it's, it's a sizable investment and how we're projecting our enrollment, how we see the capacity that we've built or can handle today will meet our five-year needs, will meet our 10-year needs, and just how we're approaching that because it's different, right, than from our K-12 mm -hmm. models. And can you speak to that a little bit? A, l a little bit, because w this is, it's, you, you make a very good point. This is a different, uh, than uh, some of our typical other initiatives that we're investing in because it's not just an operating, it's an operating and a capital yeah. aspect. Um, so certainly that's something that, that Dr. Grimm could speak to, uh, but we can't add classrooms if we don't have space to add classrooms. So that's something that has to come into the decision making um, is to have adequate space. Uh, so certainly uh, uh, that's part of what we're doing is just trying to have the space added so we can expand the program, but we can't expand the program without the space. Right. Uh, I don't know if there's anything you want to 
add to that, Dr. But Rivers? it's both, like you said. It's it is, and that's, it's and different than. And I should oh, use a yes, different yes. word, but capacity yes. meaning the, the human capital as well as the physical yes, space. Yes, we have to have the, the space, program. and that's a different, that's different part, a dynamic than some of the, the other initiatives that we have going along. So just to add on to that, um, one of the things that we're doing in the Office of Strategic Planning is working specifically with the IAC to look at how we are calculating or how systems can calculate pre-K into the state rated capacity of our, of our buildings and of our clusters. Because um, as we talked about before with the state capital request, um, how the IAC is gonna fund our seats and fund our schools and fund all of these initiatives um, in partnership with the county is critical for us to be able to, to move that infrastructure forward. In the short term, what we've been able to do is to work with the Division of Curriculum and Instruction primarily on identifying current resources we have within the system. So for example, we were able to, um, to take 12 uh, relocatables this year, repurpose them, move them, and, um, and immediately implement them for pre-K expansion. Um, and we were very proud to be able to do that because of, of some of the needs. So um, it's not that the pre-K kids are using the prelocatables. I want to be real clear about that. It's just that we're able to, we're able to identify those school sites um, where that is an appropriate thing for us to be able to do and to be able to add on. Um, but as Mr. Hartlove said, but as Dr. DiDonato said, um, it, it's not just us being able to add that, but it's also making sure that, that, that those facilities additions are not only sustainable, but we have the teachers and the other infrastructure built in to be able to do it long term. So um, I hope we answered your question. So it's really a multifaceted approach, but we are in the process of folding in through our partners in the state to determine how we're, we're factoring in things, li things like pre-K. Sure, and, and thank you for that. And I really am interested in all of it. So in terms of when I ask about capacity, it's, it's staffing, it's teachers, it's the physical space. So I'm interested in when we say we have 2,000 seats, you know, how many students do we have today? And what is our, is it sustainable? You know, what is our scalability right. um, look like? And where's our room for growth? So um, certainly, I'm sure the team talked about the tier one, tier two, and the next is tier three in terms of the requirements from Blueprint. Baltimore County Public Schools, one of the things that we learned last year when we were examining uh, pre-K and our seats compared to other LEAs in the state of Maryland is in a period of time where there was pre-K expansion grants, um, we stood still and didn't move forward. So we had a lot of ground to cover, which is why there was a significant investment in the budget this year. Um, as of last week, when I looked at the numbers, we were well over 1,900 of those uh, 2022 seats uh, that we have available. We're working with our Bar Baltimore County government partners to send out some additional messaging to families who perhaps haven't received that. But the goal is um, the first year you invest in pre-K, the following year the state funding comes um, for those students that are in your uh, schools. And so as we get those funds, that allows us to continue the expansion because we should be um, you know, nearing uh, you know, 60, 70, 80%. But right now, if you look at the numbers, um, we've made some rapid growth, but we're right around 50% uh, in terms of full day uh, because we know that's a high leverage strategy for ultimately what we exist to do, which is to make sure that students are achieving academically, so. So we're 50% enrolled today? No, no, we're 2000? way beyond 50. So we have 2,022 seats. Last week when I looked at enrollment, we had over 1,900 of those seats filled. Oh, filled. I thought yes. you said available. No, okay. no, absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> filled, taken. We had a little less than 100 seats the last time I checked, and that okay. likely has changed. Thank you for clarifying. Mm -hmm. So I have a, c a couple of questions just regarding transportation um, with the addition of all these pre-K students. So three-year-olds, um, did we have to incur significant costs with adding the, with transporting three-year-olds? Um, because I know it's, it's some special things required with them. 
so yes and no. Um, there, there are certain safety precautions that we have to take. However, with some of the other efficiencies that we've been able to build in over the last year or two, we've been able to accommodate that. That's, that's all wrapped into the plan. So when we work as, um, we, we had our, our first system-wide um, blueprint day team staff uh, last week. Transportation was represented and was right there with our early childhood team. Um, to be able to work with them and to, to be able to talk about what those implications are and with the other staff. Um, so it, it is, there, there are some additional considerations. However, also uh, to be reminded with the shift from half day to full day pre-K, that, that has also taken some operational stress off of transportation as far as pre-K students are concerned. And it's also been able to, to make things more consistent for all of our schools and all of our transportation teams. And then I know it's a public-private partnership, and are we paying for transportation to any of the pre-K students who may be attending the private child care providers? Not to my knowledge, no. No. Okay. No, but we do, have a, we do have a provision within our policy and rule that if we do have students that, a, that attend a private daycare, um, and it's, it's like before or after school, we, and it's within the boundary, we do have rules that are established for that. Any other questions? All right, thank you. So the next item on the agenda is the report on opening of schools, and for that, I call on Dr. Rogers. Thank you. The team will be coming up to uh, join me and take over. Uh, we are very pleased, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, and members of the board to provide you with a brief report on the opening schools. Opening of schools, the members of the team will talk about um, our commitment to our four priorities, uh, the work that is happening in the division of schools, the division of curriculum and instruction, um, communications and community engagement, as well as operations as we open schools on um, August 26th. That seems like a long time ago now, mm -hmm. uh, but it's only three weeks. And so I think we'll begin with a video on the first day of school, and Dr. Jones will jump right in after that. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Team BCPS welcomed over 111,000 students back to the classroom to start an incredible school year. Think about your learning. Think about what you've done here at Tech and in other places. What makes a great classroom community? I think a successful school year is really about our students making sure that they're all engaged, that uh, their social emotional well-being is taken care of, as well as high levels of achievement for them, and making sure that our staff members are equipped to do their best work. I hope that when students leave my classroom and they go on to their next chapter in middle school, I hope that I leave them with confidence. I hope that they take with them the knowledge that we can do hard things and to not be afraid to try something new. I'm super excited about the first day of school because it's our last first day, obviously. You know, this morning we got together, had a little gathering, had some food just to kick off the last year of high school, and it's our senior year, so it's nice to see everybody's fresh faces, and you know, we're looking forward to embarking our last year of high school. I think it's kind of cool. I'm going into fifth grade, so it's cool to be on top of the school. And <laughs> I mainly just want to see new people and just make new friends. Everyone was getting acclimated, meeting new classmates, new teachers, and their new school building. As a brand new school, our biggest focus today is building community, um, making sure that uh, students get to know each other, staff get to know each other, students and staff, uh, really making the connections to build a community in a new school. I was nervous and scared and stuff, but I really like it. Our first like broadcasting show was very, very good today. We had like an amazing show. Nothing went wrong, as far as I know, but everything was really great today. 
With everyone getting back into their routine, Superintendent Dr. Miriam Rogers, Baltimore County officials, and Police Chief Robert McCullough held a joint press conference to announce the launch of a new school bus camera safety program. As part of this initiative, nearly 1,000 buses will be equipped with upgraded high definition interior camera systems as well as exterior cameras. The overall goal of this program is to increase motorist awareness of students walking to and from school bus stops and the importance of not passing a school bus picking up and dropping off students. With this program, initially warnings will be issued to drivers who fail to stop. That public awareness period will begin today on the first day of school. With an added layer of safety, loved ones can rest a little easier. Now everything is in place for a great school year because everyone plays a part in making all of our students successful. Great first day of school. We'll do it all again tomorrow. Thank you to BCPS TV and the Office of Communications. Thank you. Um, hopefully, you all enjoyed the video as much as we enjoy visiting schools at the start of the school year as we um, go to the next slide. We're trying to go to the next slide. Oh, there we go. As we go to the next slide, I am excited to just share the work of the Division of, of Schools. I, um, I'm always humbled by the opportunity to serve as the as the chief of schools and to be in partnership with the various departments as you see on the slide. There is so much that we could talk about that we have accomplished in just this third um, week of school, but I'll just simply say that um, a little bit about each of the departments. So the Department of Schools, as you know, consists of 12 executive directors. We, we um, were able to uh, maintain and even continue to study best practices with the six elementary school executive directors. We have two uh, middle school only executive directors and then we have um, two high school only and then we have a, an ED of schools improve, school support and improvement uh, and then we also have an ED of school support and transformational leadership. And so we are really kind of adding on to the work of executive directors and, and tapping into their talents and their expertise so it's, it's Department of Schools ED and, and I'm incredibly um, fortunate to work with the um, team. We are, again, just studying best practices as it relates to how does our work impact the work at the school level. And so we spent a lot of time this summer just really unpacking research for better teaching, but really thinking about it through the principal supervisor's lens and how do we create that through line of our work that then impacts the uh, principal, impacts teachers, and then um, drills down to the students. I mentioned that we do have an executive director of um, school support and leadership development. He has worked very closely with Dr. Grimm and um, Dr. Burquist to make sure that our leaders are, um, are their capacity of our leaders are built in a way that cult leadership is cultivated. Culturally responsive student support services, I'm not gonna delve into that too much. Um, Ms. Mustafer presented about two weeks ago and shared what that work looks like. But she did give me my, rabbit, my ribbon to just honor the fact that it is um, Suicide Awareness Month. And so if you all wear yellow or just wanna kind of um, wear some sort of uh, ribbon to just acknowledge that we um, want to just kind of highlight that as something that their work continues to do. And then this idea of quality and timely health services, Deb Somerville, we don't see her a lot in front, but she does so much behind the scenes and kicked off the year by meeting with our nurses and our health assistants to make sure that all of our students have um, a well-rounded experience in schools. Safe and supportive environments, happy to have been able to hire and work with former Sergeant um, Eric Knox, who is, here, who is here with us, who has been an incredible partner in the work as we are continuing to examine our safety practices and, and really make sure that all of our staff and students are safe each and every day. And then last but not least, our athletics program head by Mr. Uh, Mike Sai, who has also partnered with health services and staffing and has done a phenomenal job of making sure that all practices and policies are followed at the athletics level. So I will turn this over now to my colleague, Dr. Grimm. 
Uh, good evening again, everyone. And so in operations, summertime is actually one of our busiest times of the year. And uh, at our last board meeting, I believe we shared with you some of the professional learning tenants that we engaged in over the summer. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that um, this evening, but you can see what employee training and development and in support of that and in support of building our data warehouse, our Department of Research Assessment and Accountability have done. Instead, I wanna focus on a few of the other areas of operations and just a couple of key statistics. And I'm actually gonna update a few items that are, that are on this slide. Um, so summer cleaning and beautification, we're gonna show you in the next couple slides um, some of the great work from our facilities team in, in what they've done to get our schools ready for our kids and, and looking great on inside and out. Um, we also completed the ESSER grant funded HVAC improvements, um, the last of those this summer. And as I mentioned earlier, we placed 12 relocatables to start the school year for pre-K expansion and we were very proud to do that in, in such a short time in which we did that. Uh, we opened Bedford and Nottingham, and many of you had the opportunity to visit one or both of those schools. Um, they are fabulous additions to the BCPS portfolio, and we're very excited um, to have students occupy those facilities, and we have several more that are, that are under construction or under renovation. Uh, free meals for all, as you well know, in the community eligibility program, but what you may not know is that last year we served three million more meals in the 23-24 school year than we did from the 22-23 school year as a result of CEP. We went from 14 million meals to 17 million meals last year. In IT, we implemented our new incident IQ uh, help desk to track student devices and in the first few weeks of school, we've already responded to over 16,000 tickets regarding devices, and we've put in place some new measures to help students with those accountability measures, and we're very excited about that this year. And finally, transportation responded to thousands of emails and phone calls like they always do, as well as bus stop requests. And as of this morning, an updated number here is that over 1,800 warnings have been issued since August 26 on stop arm violations. So we can already see that that program will make a difference. Um, and as a side note, the police department has shared a few videos with us already about um, some of the behaviors of motorists. So as was said in the video, and as Dr. Rogers pointed out in her message, it's critical for student walkers, um, for non-transported students, for parents, for bus riders, but also those students who are driving in our high schools um, that they are so safe and aware motorists. The next two slides just highlight some of our work. Um, I wanted to point out on this slide on all the way on the right and in your packet, this is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is Woodlawn Middle School and this is an example of before and after, just some of the things we don't think about. Um, we, we completely redid their driveway this summer. So when you think about asphalt and potholes, those things that when we're driving over them, we know that it's smooth or bumpy or what have you, but our teams are fastidious in their work to again, ensure that our students and our communities are safe. Um, you can see the Office of Logistics up in the upper left-hand corner and the thousands of materials um, that they transport and deliver over the summer, as well as preparing for the opening of those new schools. They're the folks that move our, our teachers into the new schools. They help organize, store, and prepare all the materials to open these new schools. Um, you see examples of what finished cleaning looks like, as well as delicious fruits and vegetables. On this next slide, we wanted to highlight this example of, um, of some beautification outside of our schools with Lansdowne Middle and some of the plantings that we did because we know that if students are excited as they enter the building and, and staff are proud of their building and proud of their workplace, um, the students will be able to settle in and to, to better be prepared to learn. Um, that is an example in the upper left-hand corner. For those of you that, uh, the, that were at the press conference the first day of school, that is one of our new electric buses um, that is battery powered, um, as well as a delicious taco salad and our facilities staff uh, cleaning HVAC units and using 
a lift to, to maintain our buildings. So again, we're proud of the work that we're doing in operations to prepare um, all year round for our kids, um, but there's a lot of work that goes into it and um, our, our employees do a great job. So just thank you for paying attention to those details with us. Okay, transitioning to the Division of Curriculum and Instruction. In our work, what we wanted to highlight here was some of our reorganization and what that really does to provide support to our schools. So we've really tried to align our work with the pillars of the blueprint as well as Dr. Rogers' uh, key foci area. So um, our Department of Literacy and Humanities, really focusing on our English language arts, knowing the critical importance of us um, ensuring that all of our students are reading um, on grade level by grade three and um, just the ramifications for their access of all content if they're not. Um, our division of uh, STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math, again, we. We're very excited to see some, some, some growth measures moving forward um, with our math scores and really looking at how do we continue on that forward trajectory with the professional development of teachers, follow-up coaching support um, in schools, as well as um, cross-school visits to look at instruction so that we can work on supporting our not only the professional development of our teachers who are delivering instruction, but our school administrators and staff development teachers who are providing that coaching and feedback to teachers. Um, our Department of Multilingual Achievement, again, um, Baltimore County continues to have um, increase in the number of students who are multilingual learners and ensuring that we are providing the highest quality supports to them, especially as we have continued in the year two of our um, decentralization of our ESAW centers, um, which will wrap up this upcoming school year, so students will all be uh, beginning at their neighborhood schools. Um, Again, really trying to build that uh, co school community, supports and resources within our neighborhood schools for our students. Um, our Department of Special Education Services, again, looking at how are we providing inclusive opportunities, especially for our youngest learners as we're expanding our full day um, instructional opportunities, as well as providing those more intensive supports and services for our students who need them um, throughout their academic programming. Our, uh, also, making some shifts with our Department of um, community schools and our Department of Title I and Homeless Programs. These two offices were uh, sort of mushed together in one um, large grant uh, pot, really focusing on, and we've heard some speakers over the last several board meetings really talking about the emphasis and power of community schools. So really looking at what are the needs of our community schools, what are holistic common needs that we see between community schools, how do we systematically program for those, and then what are those needs that are um, more specific to an, in, an individual community. What are the resources that they're looking for? What are the partnerships that they need? And then again, what are those partnerships that we see um, globally that could cross schools? And then how do we centrally try to help organize that for schools so that they don't have to facilitate all of those pieces? In our Department of Title I and Homeless Programs, again, those are those wraparound and additional supplemental supports that we have to our schools. Um, in our identified higher poverty areas. But again, our work really hinges on our support to schools, teachers, students, and families. So whether it is our Office of Special Education working with our um, families of our birth to five-year-olds who are just accessing um, special education services either in their home or the childcare and then their transition into school, or if it's working with our teachers and our um, Office of Employee Development so that we're providing that high quality professional development to teachers so that, again, they're coming into school prepared and ready to teach our students. So this is just highlighting our organizational structure, how we are there to support um, the overall operations of all instruction that happens within our schools. Highlighting on some of our instructional momentum that is happening within our schools. So really looking at um, high quality instructional materials. We're doing um, the tandem system-wide pilot of two uh, ELA curricula um, with students in grades 6 through 12. Um, we'll be providing some updates in the near future on those uh, beginning implementations and things that we're seeing already, um, as well as our um, 
English language development uh, curriculum for, again, students in grades 6 through 12. So really looking at how are we optimizing, ensuring that the, our students who are multilingual learners have high quality English language development courses, but also have access to rigorous content courses. And when we look at our staffing, how are we providing those opportunities for students to have um, co-teaching opportunities in their core content areas so that they are better able to access the material. When we look at assessment, grading, and credits, really looking at how are we um, supporting students in, in increased accountability for their participation in school, holding students to those higher expectations, and also looking at how are we providing students with those opportunities to earn credits along the way. Um, looking at what of our other local jurisdictions are doing, many of our the surrounding LEAs provide credits to students on a half credit basis. So for example, English 9 is English 9 Part A or 1 and English 9 B or Part 2. So along the way at the mid-year point, if you've passed the first, two the first two marking periods of school, you earn half of your English 9 credit and then you, the next part of the year, you earn the second part of your English 9 credit. Um, what we found is that by other LEAs doing that and then with students who transfer mid-year, this really ensures that students are leaving here with credits on their transcript if they've actually finished a half year versus a whole credit where we didn't award a half credit. If a student were to leave mid-year, we'd send their report cards and those information, but then it was really at the discretion of another LEA or a state to determine how they were going to interpret that. So the goal is really to provide our students with the optimal incentives and opportunities to continue their coursework. And in those cases where you have students who are struggling, having some other strategic options to try to recover courses more quickly versus you're an entire credit behind and then we're going to try to recover a course, we can try to do that at the half credit point. So again, working to try to have more students graduate on time and not find themselves in a situation where they have many credits to try to recover if they, we have those kind of academic situations. Um, so really looking at how we are continuing forward with our instructional momentum to support our students. Thank you. And good evening. Can you hear me? Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to share uh, the very busy summer that the team, uh, the communications and community engagement had and also to, to begin by just sharing that the work of the team actually touches all of the groups that are represented here. Um, the communication teams works hard all year round, really supporting messaging on behalf of schools, whether it be emergency messaging or messaging about mid-year or what have you, um, as well as CNI and all of the work related to curricular changes, grade changes and so forth, and then certainly operationally information that we need to get out to our family. So, it is a team that is busy, that is robust, and that is oftentimes really at the center of just about any major effort that we have here in Team BCPS. Um, I want to thank, I'll take this moment to thank uh, Ms. Onijala for her leadership as the Executive Director. We certainly appreciate her leadership as she is always on the ground moving, making sure that information is flowing outward to our families, but also really sitting in and making sure that she is synthesizing so that we are able to uncover for others what some of those connections may be if they're not readily apparent. So let's talk about this summer. The team was very, very busy, and that's what this slide depicts. I'll start over in the upper right with the Summer Connect campaign, and that was really designed to make sure that our families were able to stay connected to Team BCPS. Just because the schoolhouse doors closed on the end of the school year did not mean, uh, does not mean that our buildings were not bursting with all kinds of other activities for students. And we wanted to make sure that our families were not only uh, in tune with what those are, but also could anticipate things that they needed to do to prepare for the start of the school year. Uh, the Back to BCPS campaign kicked off in early August to just start the momentum building for the beginning of the school year, making sure that families had all of the materials they needed to be ready for the start of the school year. That was everything from reminders about our expectations for students, as well as the first day of school, uh, transportation information, enrollment information, all of the above was part of that comprehensive packet that schools received. And then we ended the summer with BCPS Fest, which was the largest ever 
and there was on the horizon uh, the threat of rain, so we moved it indoors, and it did not suffer at all for being indoors. In fact, I think it grew, and so we had thousands of families uh, come and avail themselves of all of the uh, different, uh, different tables and different folks who were there to make sure that they had what they needed to start school out, so we were very excited about that event. Um, and then the last um, piece there down at the bottom left, uh, which is the end of the year wrap up. I just wanted to point that out as some of the work that the team does in terms of trying to encapsulate for the system where we are. Sometimes as you're going about month to month through the year, you lose sight of where did we begin and how did we end. And so being able to encapsulate and get that message out to the community so that we've got kind of a marker as to what year one looked like and then we'll go back and see uh, what our progress, progress is as we move forward. Other things that I just want to point out is that we did have press conferences to kick off the school year. Uh, you saw from the video the collaboration with the police department. And then we've often heard about all of the work that the human resources team is doing, all of those campaigns from flyers to messaging to radio and commercials, all of those were in collaboration with the communications team and our community outreach. And so because, as I said, they're busy and the work doesn't stop, I wanted to forecast a little bit about what you can anticipate now that the school year has begun. Uh, the community engagement is something that is uh, going to be as robust as it was last year. Families in Team BCPS can look forward to BCPS curriculum nights. And under that heading curriculum nights, you can see that there will be events where families will be able to interact with view and see, uh, uh, interact with view and see presentations in curricular areas of English language arts, mathematics, early childhood education, English for speakers of other languages, as well as special education. And so we invite families to please join us for those evenings, they are very exciting. Uh, additionally, we will host 15 community conversations. Uh, those community conversations will cover a number of topics, and those topics are listed there on the slide. But just to give you a taste of what you can expect, uh, student and staff safety and school climate, Blueprint for Maryland's Future, uh, Budget Development, that whole process, we'll do those sessions again, um, Special Education Services, ELD and Multilingual Families, as well as Digital Safety and the Impacts of Social Media. So those are just some of the topics that families will be able to engage with the system around this year, and we're excited about those topics. And more than that, we're excited to hear directly from our community as we are out and about in discussion. And then those last two little um, snippets there, one in English and one in Spanish, it's just a reminder that there are multiple ways to stay connected to Team BCPS. Uh, it lists a number of social media accounts as well as other ways to stay connected. Dr. Rogers earlier mentioned our website is a valuable tool where we do archive many of the community messages as well as press releases. And certainly we are available through the Contact Us uh, mailbox that we use. People will send in information and we make sure that that information is answered and disseminated to the appropriate person. So multiple ways to stay connected. And I will just end with a reminder that if you block us or you don't answer our calls, you won't know any of these great things. So if you are a family that for whatever reason um, maybe is you know, very discerning in callers, please, it is worth your while to include BCPS on that uh, list of folks to manage to get through. So with that. I'd like to, to thank you for certainly listening to uh, just a little snippet of our start of schools and the team and I, we will open it up for questions. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, you all are doing a great job. No questions from the board. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on summer programs. And for that, I call on Dr. Rogers. Thank you, Dr. Elmendorf and Ms. Forbes is ill. Ms. Forbes is ill. Dr. Elmendorf and Dr. Elmendorf. Dr. Sorry. Elmendorf and Dr. Elmendorf are going, uh, he is going to share a very exciting report. Um, last year we revamped how we were um, approaching summer programs. We partnered uh, with the Lavinia Group. We had more than 12,000 students uh, attend the program, and uh, we are very excited for you to just hear about the data um, and the outcomes of the students. So with that, Dr. Elmendorf, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. 
Yeah, this is really an exciting presentation, and um, it's really a result of work that started this time last year, even before this time last year. Um, where we sat with the superintendent and talked about our collaborative vision or cooperative uh, vision about uh, summer programs for this past summer, um, in light of the fact that you know ESSER funding was was something that we weren't going to be able to necessarily access for summer programs and looking at the superintendent's priorities and making sure that our summer programs were going to be very much aligned with the priorities of the school system. And so we started off um, late last summer, early fall, with uh, doing some, really put our heads down, did some uh, research on what um, good summer programs look like. When I say good summer programs, I mean how are we identifying students? What types of curriculum are we using? How are we connecting it to what we did during the school year? Um, and then we took that research and we worked with every uh, division and department and office in the school system to come up with a plan for summer programs that I'm gonna talk to you about tonight. In fact, if you have trouble sleeping at all, I'll email you my lit review so that you can take a look at that and help you to get to sleep on some uh, data related to summer programs. Okay, so this slide kind of summarizes the scope of summer programs. As you can see, we had over 12,000 students enrolled. Um, one of the numbers I want to point out here, because you might not be intimately familiar with it, is the number two there for evening summer program sites. Those are two high school sites, and we decided to incorporate those for students who um, work during the day in the summer um, so that they can uh, recover credit, and I'll talk more about high school in a couple minutes, but so that we can cover, uh, recover credit at night. I actually visited both of those sites, and they were really um, bustling uh, sites. Um, Students were expressing to me when I asked them that they were really thankful for those sites because they do work during the day and they need to work during the day to, to make some money, but they had an opportunity to um, still recover some credit. So this slide uh, essentially summarizes the enrollment for summer programs. As I alluded to a little bit earlier, we were really deliberate in how we invited students, meaning uh, we worked with the Department of um, Research and Accountability and Assessment to determine um, the type of student that would benefit the most from being in summer programs. So we collected data on every single student in the school system and sent information to schools so that they could make really informed decisions about who they were gonna invite into their summer programs. And we, um, these are the students who accepted those invitations. This is the uh, demographics of those students. This is a little bit of a review from what we shared with you in the spring. So the elementary summer program focus uh, was on instruction in, in literacy and math. And as we discussed in the spring, in, for literacy, we again, the research shows that the more we can connect what we did during the school year to the summer, the better students do. And so we actually used the same curriculum um, from the school year um, for literacy and math. So HMH into reading. Uh, the literacy curriculum, it was, it's, it was a great opportunity because that curriculum actually has embedded in it uh, two additional units of HMH that are not ta taught during the school year. So it's the same model that students saw during the school year, but they this, these are uh, units that they wouldn't have seen specifically. And in math, we used Bridges inter Intervention Kit, and the um, curriculum that was developed for that specifically was developed by our Office of Mathematics. One thing I don't think I talked about in the spring with you is that we did fidelity checks for these programs because we wanted to make sure that if we're gonna spend all this time creating curriculum for our, our students and for our teachers to use, that we're making sure that it's implemented um, with fidelity. Um, I, I would say, and this is anecdotal, but um, there were more adults visiting campuses this summer than I probably have ever seen before. And so our administrators certainly were doing fidelity checks, but we had um, staff from various offices, including Title I, that were also doing fidelity checks in our, in our elementary schools. So you'll notice this slide says initial data. I wanna point that out because um, we are gonna share with you again in hopefully November, December, some other data that, uh, that we'll be able to extrapolate after seeing how our students are doing here in the beginning of the year. So this isn't the only data that we're going to collect to determine how um, our students were impacted in elementary schools, but we wanted to give you a snapshot of what we um, were able to, to glean in the last couple of weeks after summer school ended. So uh, this is a student shows you student performance at the beginning and end of summer in both literacy and mathematics. So this was a pretest that was given to students in literacy and mathematics. Um, one of the lessons learned this summer is that not as many students took the assessments as we would have liked. And so one of our corrective actions really is to 
make sure that as many students as possible are taking both the pre and post assessment. As you can imagine, it's four weeks, half days. There's a really limited amount of time that we um, see our students, and so um, getting those pre and post assessments taken is a, is a challenge, but we already have some good ideas of how to increase that percentage rate of students taking. Um, th and the reason I mention that is because if my DRA friends were here, they would probably question the uh, absolute validity of these numbers, but these are the numbers we have and they're accurate, but I just don't know that I would put this in my literature review or my research report for grad school. Uh, this is a little bit of a review as well um, from what we share with you in the spring. So as Dr. Rogers mentioned, we partnered with Lavinia. So again, the research showed us um, that this was a, um, an approach to summer learning for middle school students specifically that has really reaped a lot of rewards for our students. Um, a, the qu a question was asked in the spring, why don't we do in middle school what we did in elementary? And that's because the curriculum in middle school didn't afford us the same opportunities to have you know, the extra units, for example, that were available in HMH. So we had to look elsewhere. And th uh, this curriculum was very much aligned with not only the system priorities, but the Maryland state standards. And th the, it was specifically designed for Baltimore County using um, the standards in Maryland and actually leveraging what they call power standards. So focusing on specific standards that can really give us a lot of bang for our buck, if you will, because again, it's four weeks of half days. So I, I guess the way I like to explain it is we didn't cover a whole bunch of standards in far and wide. We focused on some really specific standards that we are know are important for students to be able to um, excel in their next grade level. So the assessments that are used for Lavinia were evaluated by an independent third party evaluation. Also evaluation of Summer Rise program compared achievement gains of, on the Lavinia group assessments using iReady and NWEA map growth from fall 21 to fall 23. So this is an exciting slide. Um, and in the next few slides, you're gonna see a little bit more extensive um, evaluation of the program than you did in elementary school because this is a contract that you agreed um, with us in the spring, and we wanna make sure that we were really critical of the impact that this um, curriculum was going to have for our students. Uh, so as you can see here, these really exciting gains. Uh, so this is, again, pre and post assessment data. So for ELA, the pretest average was 27.95 and increased to 46.17, a total growth of 18.2. And in mathematics, the average math pretest was 23.2 and increased uh, on the post assessment to 38.3. And this is for all, all three grades in middle school, six through eight. So Lavinia also helps us to not only look at how students did from a pretest to a post-test standpoint, but they also look at um, proficiency. They have uh, four perfor um, performance levels. The four performance levels used by Lavinia are proficient, basic, approaching, and below basic. And if, if you're familiar with MCAP at all, and I know you are, it's very similar to um, the measures that they use for MCAP. So this slide captures the proficiency rates in literacy. The key takeaways here are that 13.76 percentage point increase in students scoring proficient. So there was a 29.72 percent um, point de decrease in students scoring below basic. So when compared to Lavinia's national data, I thought this was really exciting, in 2023, the national average for students, so these are students across the country who were using Lavinia, in grades seven through nine was a 14 point decrease in students scoring below basic. And as you can see here, BCPS, um, decreased by much more than that at 30%. So not only did Lavinia curriculum um, help our students to do well, but we did better than other school districts who were using Lavinia, because we have great teachers. Um, oh, sorry, next slide here. This, so this is mathematics proficiency. As you can see on this slide, there was a 10.9% um, point in increase in students scoring proficient, which is represented in blue, in mathematics between the pre and post test and 23.6 point decrease in students scoring below basic as represented in red. Uh, again, in 2023, the national average for students in grades seven through nine was a 16 point decrease in students scoring below basic, but as you can see, BCPS decreased by more than nearly 27%. All right, so this is my favorite slide. We got, I got this idea from you, Dr. Rogers, of uh, giving a shout out to a couple schools who really showed, had some exemplary work. This is Franklin Middle School and Stemmers Run Middle School. 
So students from many of our summer programs made great progress, especially in middle school with our use of Lavinia, but we want to highlight these two middle schools. Um, as you can see, the percentage of students scoring below basic in literacy at Franklin Middle reduced from 68.6 on the pre-assessment to just 15.7, and the percentage of students scoring proficient rose from under 1% on the pre-assessment to 25.5 uh, on the post-assessment. And students at Stemmer's Run made impressive gains in the areas of mathematics with the percentage of students scoring below basic moving from over 62% on the um, pre-assessment to under 2% on the post and the percentage of students scoring proficient on the pre from 3.7 to over 26 on the post assessment. These are exciting numbers, but they're not surprising numbers to me because I've visited both of these schools and Dr. DiDonato was with me in at, at least one of these two and what we talked about as we walked out the front door was how engaged the, the administrators were. They were visiting classrooms. They told us about conversations that they had with teachers about curriculum, about student learning, about um, how our, our teachers felt about the implementation of the curriculum. We saw that there were incentives being put in place with attendance. Um, earlier, our, uh, some of our attendance team um, was here, and we did the Here For It campaign in the summer, and it was really kind of a rigorous uh, rollout from our team, and these two schools specifically really embraced that attendance challenge, and as you can see, a, a lot of what they were doing paid off. Again, it, it, visiting these two schools, I'm not surprised that their numbers were awesome, and it's, it's a really helpful for, for me to be able to talk to administrators next summer to say, these are the things you need to do because this is what we know works. So high school summer programs weren't quite as, as different than they have been in the past um, as it relates to elementary and middle school because we know that our high school students primarily go to summer programs in order to make sure that they can graduate or that they can continue what they were um, doing in the spring so that they can <coughs> stay on track for their next grade in high school. Um, so summer the summer allows students to finish up what they started in the spring. This past summer, 1,003 courses were completed and 104 students graduated in August as a result of completing at least one of these courses. Um, also, and what's not uh, reflected on the slide, is we tried something new this summer that we hope to expand and uh, replicate next summer, which is to have a summer centralized summer program for original credit. So we did this for health. So if 24 students took Health 910 as a traditional uh, course this summer. It was virtual, but it was traditional in that um, they were not using a, um, a digital product to facilitate their learning. It was with a teacher. Um, so uh, 20 students earned a half credit. 15 students took Health 1112, and all 15 earned a half credit. So altogether, 39 students in Baltimore County Schools took Health and 35 uh, of the uh, earned credit in Health. So that's something we are, one of our next steps is to see if we can uh, expand that to other subjects, but also um, enhance what we're doing with health as well. And the last slide here is to really show you what we are hoping to do for next steps. Like I said, I wanna come back to you in November, December with some more data that gives you some more context of uh, the impact of summer programs on students. We will work with our DRAA folks to determine some valid comparisons that we can make between students who participated in some summer programs and perhaps those who were invited but were not able or chose not to participate if we're able to make some of those comparisons so we can make some informed decisions going forward. Um, we also have uh, qualitative data that we just have not finished crunching yet. So we surveyed our teachers in all three levels. Um, Lavinia also surveyed teachers about the professional development which um, I know a lot of my colleagues have uh, attended the professional development and said it was one of the best professional development sessions they've attended, so that was encouraging news as well. And also, we want to, as I said earlier, uh, identify ways in which we can make sure that our most or all of our students are taking the pre and post assessment so they're, we're truly getting a valid idea of how summer learning impacted our student population. And then lastly, we have already begun planning for uh, summer programs in 2025. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Uh, Ms. Harvey and Ms. Hinn.
So let me answer the first question first. Um, I don't know the exact numbers of what our capacity was. We had a pretty rigorous planning process to make sure that we had um, a, a capacity at each site. So what I didn't share in here, but I did share in the spring, is that some of our sites, most of our sites, had more than one school represented at that site. So we would let um, the schools know what their grouping is going to be and how many seats each of those schools at that site would have available to them. So then they would they would over invite, so let's say a school has 100 seats available at a site, they would maybe invite 130 knowing that at least 30 are not going to be able to come. And then they, as students uh, declined invitations, they could move down their list of who are priorities to invite so that they could eventually um, fill the capacity of their, of their program. So the capacity of the programs and the enrollment in the programs should be, or were similar, um, the enrollment ended up being slightly less than the capacity because of students who said they were coming and chose not to come or weren't, weren't able to come to the program. Is that, did I, there was two parts to that question. Did I answer both of them? Yes. No, or <laughs> the second part was around the students who did Oh, yeah, yeah. Ms. Harvey, could you make sure your mic is on? Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, how that data is um, uh, compared with the invitations extended, and then, then my last question is, what is the criterion used for to receive an invitation? Great questions. So let me start the, with the last part of that question and go backwards. So the criteria was somewhat complicated in that it was an algorithm that was developed by the D Department of Research Accountability and Assessment, but the inputs included, and I did write these down, the inputs included grades, assessment scores, attendance rates, and other um, inputs. Um, I think farms rate was included, but it was a combination of data points that were kind of, DRAA did their magic and came up with an algorithm to show what the priority should be for which students should be invited first and, and moving on down the list. So uh, there's not a specific criterion, we wanted to make sure that it was, it captured all the things that we know are important based on the research for the students that benefit the most um, from being in a summer program. I, it, it's something we can look at with DRAA for next year as far as the, the breakdown of race for students who were invited. Because individual schools did the inviting, we don't necessarily have data on the race of the students who were invited because I don't have the list of students who the school may have invited to go back and cross-reference it with what the racial breakdown would have been. Yeah. Ms. Hinn. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Almondorf, for sure. the great presentation. Thank you. Um, do you have attendance data for the enrollees in terms of um, overall do. attendance? Yeah, the overall attendance rate, rate was 737 and is that for overall, or do you have it by, I'm sorry, I'm yeah, asking can, uh, for specifics, elementary, middle, and high. I do. So it was overall was 73.07. Okay. Um, Pre-K-3 and pre-K-4 was 80.3. Elementary above pre-K-4 was 75.4. Middle school was 73.5. And high school was 71.7. Okay. Okay. And for the pre- and post-assessment data that you shared, did that exclude those that may have attended, may have taken the pre-assessment but not the post-assessment. It Correct. did, so you, we're looking at apples to apples in terms of students. Absolutely, Sorry, so I had my DRA those numbers are only on students here. who took both. <laughs> only students that took both. Correct. Terrific, and let's see, this question may or may not apply. I'm curious as to whether or not you were able to correlate then the attendance with the gains that you saw, but if it's only students that took both, would that necessarily correlate to 100% attendance? Not necessarily then. Not necessarily. It does indicate that you could assume that their attendance, they were either lucky or they had a relatively good attendance because they were there on both days, uh, sure. the day of the pre and the day of the post. So we know that we're they were there in the first weekend and last week at least. <laughs> first we hope last. they were there in the middle as well. It'd be interesting based on um, what you shared in the two exemplar um, to see if the, there were any correlation between that. Mm -hmm. and, and thank you for sharing those examples. That's fantastic. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Damanowski and then Mr. McMillian. 
Just thank you for that. Uh, one quick follow up from that. Do you have the total number of students who took the pre and post assessments? The percentage? Just the total, like the total number of students that were tested out of the. I know the percentage was um, 55 to 60 percent of the students who were enrolled um, took both the pre and the post. 7,700 students. Yeah, it's in here somewhere. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. McMillian. Rogers. Dr. Almendorf, you mentioned there were two evening programs. What schools hosted those? Kenwood and, it's on my high school slide, um, Overly. Kenwood and Overly. Yes. What, what, and uh, what kind of numbers are we talking about, just approximately? Uh, I believe we had between 30 and 50 at each site. And the, in, some, in some cases, the students didn't show up every night. So in high school, specifically, we use um, what we call flex blend model. So students can work um, somewhat independently for, for a part of their course. And so they could potentially do some of this away from their teacher and then interact with their teacher either virtually or in person at the school to um, help them with the direct, in direct instruction to get to the next part portion of the course. So historically, in attendance rates in high school have they look a little bit lower because students are doing um, more of their work outside of the classroom than anybody would be in middle school or elementary school. So the other programs were 20 days for four hours a day. How did that, how was that scheduled? Those the evening schools. Yeah, th they did not meet every, every day. Those were just tw um, twice a week. But what kind of time frame too? Uh, it was a two and a half hours, I believe. It's similar to what we do with EDLP, or evening school. It was modeled after that. In fact, it's, that's why we chose those two schools, because they're used to, to doing EDL. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a few questions. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Savoy. You turn your mic on. I was just wondering why you didn't have one on the uh, west side. We did, Woodlawn. Woodlawn? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. One on the east and one on the west. Because you said Kenwood and Overly. Oh, did I say Kenwood? Sorry. And Overly, yeah. My bad. Okay. It was Woodlawn. <laughs> I accept. <laughs> yeah. I had a wood in it. <laughs> so um, I just had a, a few questions. Um, the power standards, you um, how were they identified? They are, were identified by Lavinia based on their, their understanding of our, our standards in Maryland. So they are standards that um, would impact other standards more uh, indirectly. So they have they cover more ground than uh, you know, than some of our other standards might. Did we look to see if the power standards um, connected to the standards that students demonstrate difficulty with on map assessments or in state assessments to see if there was a connection with the power standards they've identified and then the standards that our students have demonstrated that they have challenges with? So I think one of the things, and having visited the summer programs, um, so part of the challenges that we have with our math, our students demonstrating their math knowledge is really their ability to reason mathematically and demonstrate their explanations. The, all of the problems um, that students did within the summer program were story problem based and it actually aligned with um, our illustrative math um, instructional program. So it was a very similar structure. Some of the warm ups were very similar. So the structure of all of their work was story problem based. So they were constantly writing rationales, providing justifications, explaining their thinking, modeling, and reasoning. So the modeling and reasoning skills are areas that we continue to struggle with um, on MCAP and uh, through our various assessments. So that it was intensive practice on an area of, of really big need for us. So I think what it says is with really strategic instruction and practice in areas, we can make a high impact change. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is board member comments and agenda setting, and I'll start with Ms. Hinn. Thank you, no comments this evening. Ms. Frimpong. No comments. Ms. Pumphrey. No comments. Ms. Chika Kalu. Um, only to students. I will see you guys, well, technically tomorrow, but I'm moving forward in just a few weeks. I'll see all of you, so I can't wait. And 
have a great week back to school. Ms. Zaleski. No comments, thank you. Dr. Savoy. None at this time. Mr. McMillian. No, thank you. Ms. Harvey. No comments, thank you. Mr. Young. No comments. Ms. Dominowski. I'm sorry, I have a comment. Uh, just having had a unique um, opportunity to be with the Joppa Town community on Friday evening, I wanted to express my extreme condolences to the Grant family and the Joppa Town community, who I know is a strong community and is already working together to support each other, to um, you know have schools where we can send our kids and know they will be safe and children can be safe in a place no matter what's going on around them. So that's all I wanted to say. Good night. Thank you, and I have no additional comments. So the last item on agenda on the agenda is announcements. The next board meeting will be held Tuesday, September 24, 2024, at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight. The meeting is now adjourned.